All right, welcome everyone. Happy Wednesday. Um, Ms. Tanner, please call the roll. Yes, Basine. Here. Campson. Here. Clanton. Gabriel. Present. Jordan. Here. Smith. Here. Martin. Here. Okay, I duly call this meeting to order. Um, first on our agenda, we have um, the gifted education needs assessment um, under our academic affairs. Ms. Uh, Dr. Birdsong, would you like to introduce? Peter? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Martin, Vice Chairman Jordan, members of the school board and members of our community. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this afternoon before we get started with our first presentation. As we return from the Thanksgiving holiday, I certainly would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank some very special staff members who have been acknowledged by members of our community for their undying commitment and dedication to Norfolk Public Schools and for being examples of what community really means. Can you imagine being stranded in your car with a dead battery on the morning of December 1st when it was freezing cold outside and miles away from your destination? Well, this happened to a member of our regional com community and um, fortunately for this community member, he was able to pull into Booker T. Washington's high school's parking lot before his car completely stalled. After many failed attempts to contact family members to jumpstart his car, he literally sat shivering in his car for almost an hour and realized that he would need the assistance of total strangers. Two of those strangers ended up being Kofi Bohr, custodian at Booker T. Washington High School, and the school's lead security officer, Daryl Stroud. Mr. Bohr offered to return to his home, actually all the way back from the school to his home, to retrieve his own jump box so that he could assist this individual whom he had never met, and he refused to take this gentleman's last $5 as offered to him for assisting. Prior to Mr. Boer's return, Officer Stroud noticed the community member in the parking lot and approached him to assist. The community member described being confused by Officer Stroud's immediate help without question and without knowing him, reassuring him that it was going to be okay. Before Mr. Boer could return with his jump box, Officer Stroud was able to successfully jumpstart the car. In the words of the community member, Officer Stroud and Mr. Boer stood in the freezing cold for a great length of time with him, mentoring him like two fathers about car batteries and their love for Norfolk Public Schools and Booker T. Washington High School and its staff. He further stated that it was beautiful to see men talk that highly of their coworkers, their jobs, which they love so much, Norfolk Public Schools and Booker T. Washington High School. The community member noted that his email addressed to me was not about a jump start for his car's dead battery, but about the two hidden treasures at Booker T. Washington High School. Thank you, Mr. Boer and Officer Stroud for all that you do for Norfolk Public Schools. And in the words of a total stranger who was blessed to have met you, Thank you for your humble good deeds in the Norfolk community and for being the examples of what strong, positive, honorable men are supposed to be. I also received an email from a member of our East Beach Buddies who recognized Deborah Price, who serves as a math specialist at Ocean View Elementary School, for being an outstanding community partner who is well organized, a creative thinker, innovative, a problem solver, an excellent communicator, and a treasure for the teams of the East Beach Buddies. As a result of Ms. Price's partnership with the East Beach Buddies, every child at Ocean View Elementary School was gifted two brand new books from the East Beach community. Thank you, Ms. Price, for being a highly valued member of Team MPS and for all that you do to engage our community in our work to provide a high quality education to each of our students. 
In addition to our brilliant teachers and staff, I would like to give a special shout out to some exceptional students in Helen Martin's AP government class at Morey High School for their participation in this year's virtual Bring Your Legislator to School Day event, which was held last week. Thank you for representing Norfolk Public Schools so well and for asking thought-provoking questions to myself and representatives of the Norfolk delegation. You truly inspire me each and every day to be the very best that I can be as I serve as your superintendent of schools. For that, I thank you. Moving on to our agenda at hand, this afternoon, Dr. James Pohl, our Chief Academic Officer, will support a discussion of the School Division's Gifted Education Needs Assessment, which will be presented by Drs. Jennifer and Tracy Cross of the College of William and Mary. Next, Dr. Linnell Gibson, our schools, uh, our chief schools officer, and Mr. Tim Mallory, our senior coordinator of safety and security, will review and lead a discussion regarding the school division's school resource officer program. This presentation will be supported by Principal Brand Brandy Smedley of Norview Middle and two of our very own school resource officers, SRO Robert Williams and SRO Sheldon Davis, so that you will have the opportunity to hear voices from the field as it relates to our SRO program. Mr. Fraley, our Chief Operations Officer, will then review the draft resolution for the return of Poplar Hall Elementary School to the City of Norfolk. Dr. Pohl, along with the members of the Board's Policy Review Committee, will then review pertinent school board policies for consideration and adoption during the upcoming business meeting. After the review of policies, the school board will then discuss the return of school transition plan for in-person instruction as it relates to health metrics and other pertinent factors. Again, I applaud the efforts of our board to keep the safety of our students, teachers, teachers and staff at the forefront of all decision making and for using data to drive those decisions. We hope that you find each of these presentations to be informative and helpful. So thank you, Madam Chair Martin, Vice Chairman Jordan, and members of the school board. This concludes my remarks for this afternoon, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Pohl to get us started with our first presentation. Dr. Pohl. All right. Thank you, Dr. Birdsong. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Martin, Vice Chairman Jordan, Dr. Birdsong, and members of the board. I'm here this afternoon with Dr. Jennifer Cross and Dr. Tracy Cross from the Center of Gifted Education at William & Mary. As you may recall, in the fall of 2018, Norfolk Public Schools partnered with William & Mary to conduct a needs assessment of our gifted program. The process for the needs assessment took place from the fall of 2018 through the fall of 2019. This afternoon, Drs. Cross and Cross will share the results of the needs assessment as well as possible next steps to consider. Following the presentation, Bruce Brady, Executive Director of Curriculum Instruction, Carla Stead, our Senior Coordinator of Gifted Education and Academic Rigor Services, as well as myself, will join the present presenters again for any questions the board may have. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Tracy Cross. I think you're on mute, Dr. Cross. Um, hi there. I'm honored to be here representing the Center for Gifted Education. Dr. Jennifer Cross and I will make the presentation. About two and a half years ago, as noted, I was contacted by the leadership team of Norfolk Schools to see if we might be interested in talking about the possibility of conducting a, an evaluation of gifted education services in the Norfolk Schools. So we met and spent some time together, actually, over a period of about a month making decisions about what, what made the best sense at this point. I wanna start by sharing with you the, the definition used by MPS schools about gifted education, gifted students. It reads as follows. Gifted students are those whose abilities and potential for accomplishment are so outstanding that they require special services and programs to meet their educational needs. Gifted students come from many backgrounds and their special abilities cover a wide spectrum of human potential. You can tell by that definition that a lot must go on in a, a large school district like the Norfolk schools 
to reach those goals. So if you would, please uh, switch to the next uh, slide. We discussed um, different ways of doing program evaluations and uh, came up with three different levels or steps that might be taken to do a comprehensive evaluation over time. In the first level, um, each of the, let's see. So there are different things being considered in these three. The first is a needs assessment, which is a type of program evaluation, but has very focused and limited scope. Um, you do needs assessments when you want to study in depth um, specific areas to follow up on. And the, so your advice and data collected during a level one needs assessment tends to be broad, but not very deep. It sets the stage and, and points at areas that need to be considered with a much more substantial level of commitment in terms of program evaluation data being collected. The level two, uh, and again, this is sort of a traditional model way of thinking about program evaluation, looks at issues of fidelity. What is what's being claimed actually being carried out is one way of thinking about it. Are we doing what we claimed we would be doing to the extent and with the quality that we have said we're aspiring to? So um, again, that tends to be much deeper, but not very broad. It's difficult and expensive to do a level two evaluation of such a large school district's programs. So level one illustrates areas that need additional attention. Level two provides that kind of attention in a narrow focus. A level three type evaluation tends to focus on the outcome of the gifted program itself, looking at the services effectiveness, looking at uh, students' accomplishments, achievement, and so forth. Uh, is, is the school district reaching its aims? And that's usually defined in terms of the achievement of students and so forth. So it tends to be both deep and broad. So if you would uh, go to the next slide, in the next slide, you'll see that we selected to do the level one needs assessment. And that I thought was a, a, a well-informed decision given where the concerns and ideas were at that time, approximately two and a half years ago, this made the most sense. So Dr. Cross and I, with the help of leadership team there at MPS, created uh, an approach to gathering these kinds of data. And Jennifer will provide considerably more detail and specificity to what I'm talking about. But you'll see that it was a successful needs assessment and provided a lot of information school, to the school district. So we're glad to be able to finally come and present it to you and will be available to uh, try to address any questions that you might have at the end. So let me turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Cross. And you can advance to the next slide, Ms. Tanner. Um, so thank you for having us at the meeting today. I really appreciate it. We, um, we have spent a lot of time looking at uh, Norfolk School's gifted education program and are delighted to be able to present to you tonight. Um, so the purpose of a needs assessment is to create a picture of what's going on presently in the system and uh, what is the current state of affairs in the division's gifted education program. Uh, to answer this question, we needed to collect data that would inform us about the division. So this meeting is being recorded. The recording has stopped. Uh-oh. Is that okay? Yeah, please continue. Okay. Um, you can go to the next slide. Gifted services in this division begin with cluster grouping in elementary classrooms and support from the GRTs, who are the gifted resource teachers. While elementary students remain in the regular classroom for the majority of their time in school, the teacher is expected to differentiate instruction with the help of the GRT. Identified gifted students are pulled out on a regular basis for reading or math enrichment lessons. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Sorry. 
Um, middle school students can apply to the Young Scholars Program, the only NPS offering that's exclusively for identified gifted students, which accepts approximately 40 sixth graders each year. Secondary schools introduce special programs, including an international baccalaureate curriculum at the Academy for Discovery at Lakewood and Granby High School, and STEM and performing arts options at the high school level. Honors and AP courses are available to high school students. The division offers many options, as you can see, for its gifted students. This needs assessment is intended to identify areas within these offerings that need further examination. We began the needs assessment by collecting information that helped us construct a detailed description of the services at MPS. We then interviewed representatives of several stakeholder groups. GRTs and parents were interviewed in focus groups and other stakeholders were interviewed individually. From our analysis of the interviews, we developed nine online surveys targeting the stakeholders specifically. To increase the response rates, most surveys included an option for respondents to answer more questions if they had time. In the full report, you can see that some people were able to answer these additional questions. The surveys were distributed to MPS employees and students with the help of the Department of Assessment, Research and Accountability. Parents of identified gifted students were contacted multiple times through email, mailings and by word of mouth from April to September of 2019. Principals, GRTs, counselors and other MPS employees were surveyed in April of 2019 and teachers and students received the survey at the beginning of the 1920 school year. From the 46 schools, we received survey responses from 19 building administrators, which included principals and assistant principals. Only one high school principal responded to the survey. So that should be kept in mind as you look at results. All 27 GRTs who were employed at the time responded. The counselors who responded were spread fairly evenly across elementary and secondary schools. Other NPS employees were in roles varying from central office administrator to teacher specialist. Only seven of these other employees responded to the survey. And the majority of teachers responding were at the elementary level. The 335 parents who responded were asked to share information about each of their identified gifted children. These 335 parents reported on 431 children. To put this response rate in context, in, at the time of the survey, there were 5,535 identified gifted students in the division with 2,270 2, at the elementary level and 3,265 at the secondary level. The responses represent fewer than 10% of parents who could have responded, although we can't know how many parents have multiple identified gifted children, so we can't be 100% sure of the response rate. The majority of elementary students, I'm sorry, that didn't, that looked very different on my screen. I'm sorry, it's all jumbled. Um, the majority of elementary students responding to the survey were at one school, the Academy for Discovery at Lakewood. A quarter of elementary students responding were from this school. But you can see we had representation from schools across the division. Of the 2,270 identified gifted elementary students, 515 or about 23% responded to our survey. And nearly half of the secondary student respondents were from the Academy of International Studies at Rosemont. Other middle schools were not as well represented in our sample. High school students from three of the five MPS high schools responded to the survey. And we had a total of 774 secondary students. All stakeholders, except for the elementary students, were asked to give their impressions of how well NPS is fulfilling its mission as stated in the local plan, which is a description of the local of the services within the division, to ensure that all students maximize their academic potential, develop skills for lifelong learning, and are successful contributors to a global society. On average, the highest agreement was among the secondary students, followed by teachers and GRTs. And on average, principals and other NPS employees disagreed that NPS is meeting these objectives. 
Participants were asked about the expectations NPS places on its identified gifted students to achieve. The majority of principals, GRTs, and other NPS employees considered expectations to be too low, while most counselors, teachers, secondary students, and parents considered them to be appropriate. The fact that quite a few participants, particularly teachers, did not know whether these expectation, expectations are appropriate, as represented by the brown bar in the chart, suggests the need for greater communication of the division's expectations. Principals, GRTs, counselors, and teachers were asked if they considered funding at their school to be adequate. On a scale of one is a strongly disagree to five strongly agree, the average response was within the disagree range for all these groups, falling be below the midpoint of three, indicating that they did not believe there was adequate funding. So an analysis of the survey responses identified six areas of need, the resources for gifted services, training, extent of offerings, the quality of gifted services, communication and identification and placement. And I'll go into each of these a little bit better further. Can you go back one? Yeah, that's it. In addition to the perceptions of inadequate funding reported previously, teachers, counselors, and GRTs would like to be able to collaborate more frequently on behalf of identified gifted students. GRTs are in high demand, but they are stretched thin, especially those reporting to multiple schools. According to multiple stakeholder groups, counselors do not have the time and in some cases the training to support gifted students' academic and social and mental health needs. Teachers report they do not have time, materials, and training needed to differentiate the curriculum. Principals, counselors, and teachers expressed a desire for more training in gifted education and working with gifted students. Many respondents agreed that more advanced level courses should be offered at the middle and high school levels. At the elementary level, parents would like students to have more time in gifted services. Many elementary students would like to have more time with their GRT. Some elementary teachers indicated this as a need as well. The quality of gifted services was called into question by parents and students. Elementary students spend the majority of their time in school in the regular classroom, which is often too easy for them, and where they often already know the material. This is often the case even in their gifted pullout classes. Secondary students find their classes often appropriate for their ability level, not too easy or too difficult. High school students report more frequent challenge than middle school students, and many commented on the overwhelming amount of work they are required to do in their advanced classes. This may indicate an area of need as well if teachers are equating more work with greater challenge. Training in how to appropriately target their lessons may reduce stress levels among highly capable students at NPS. Many parents commented on the need for better gifted services, such as more rigorous coursework and more options for their children. Communication appears to be lacking in a number of situations. For example, many teachers and parents were unaware of the expectations for achievement. The school principal's commitment to gifted education was not always known. <coughs> Excuse me. Parents and teachers were not always aware of the options available to identified gifted students. Pardon me. Sorry. With GRTs stretched thin, particularly at the high school level, teachers were uncertain of what support GRTs could offer. Parents expressed confusion about the meaning of their children's identification and what special services their child was receiving or could take advantage of. A lack of communication may be implicated when NPS employee stakeholder groups in this study consider that students are sometimes appropriately identified as gifted and somewhat agree that the process for identifying students is fair. More frequent communication about identification criteria and the review process may alleviate these less than glowing responses. Quite a few teachers and even parents indicated that they believe students who are unable to do advanced level work should not be included in gifted services. This points to a potentially critical problem with what is happening once students are identified. 
I will talk more about this in the next slide. Many MPS employees are uncertain whether students have been exited from gifted services according to the guidelines outlined in the local plan. When a student who has been identified as gifted is not placed in courses that will help them maximize their potential, they have been effectively exited from gifted services. Next slide. Concerns about the identification process reflect a possible disconnect between how students are identified and how they are supported. This disconnect would disproportionately affect low-income students. There is no reason to think that potential for high achievement is different for low-income students, but how this potential manifests may, may be different. Research has found that low-income students will rarely do as well as their wealthier age peers on standardized tests of achievement. NPS takes account of this disparity by having tier two and tier three procedures that allow for criteria other than a high test score to be assessed for identification of giftedness. Students growing up with resources have experiences and opportunities to develop their academic abilities that are not available to most students from low income backgrounds. Travel, museum visits, access to technology, tutoring, private lessons, for example. When students from low-income backgrounds with potential are identified as gifted, they will necessarily require greater support to make up for the difference in their education-related experiences. Many teachers and parents complain that students should be retested to see if they are still gifted. This relationship between identification of students with potential and the assumption that they should be able to perform at the same level as tier one students without additional support should be closely examined. It's important to remember that this study was not a comprehensive evaluation. It assessed perceptions of stakeholders to identify areas that need further exploration. This study suggests that a future evaluation should look closely at the following areas. Scrutinize the resources available for gifted services, particularly GRT assignments. Evaluate training offered to NPS staff. Evaluate gifted service offerings at elementary, middle, and high school levels. Evaluate the quality of offerings, particularly the level of challenge and the amount of work. Assess communications among stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, and counselors. Evaluate the support given to students identified via tier two and three criteria and determine whether gift, identified gifted students are appropriately exited from services. And now Tracy is gonna make some summary comments. I hope. Just a, few, just a few things to emphasize. Having conducted dozens and dozens of evaluations of school programs and schools for gifted kids, there are certain patterns that you see that cut across different program types and even demographics. We, uh, one in particular I wanna mention is the high school concern raised by students about the amount of work that's expected of them. This is an example of one of those complaints that has existed in almost every single evaluation I have conducted over the past 35 years. So what I'd like you to think about is how important context is here. If you take rigor, as, as it manifests in the high school courses like advanced placement or honors, uh, what you find is a fair amount of work expected. Well, these students tend to be in multiple courses, uh, multiple AP courses or honor courses or other rigorous courses. So they end up with a, a pretty busy workload. Their feedback about the degree of workload really isn't about the course per se, and rather, but rather about the it's competing with their life outside of school. So the aggregate of several courses expectations is a fair amount of time, but the actual ex expectation for each course could be quite reasonable and tends to be quite reasonable. So I would encourage you to interpret that kind of feedback by looking at it more closely and realizing that when a student spends X amount of time doing homework in a particular class, it means that they're not on their computer or they're not playing games or they're not with their friends or they're not relaxing or doing other things. And you can imagine how at 16, 17 years old, um, that could be bothersome to you. So it isn't necessarily an indicator that there's something wrong with the program as much as it is the uh, desire for young people to also have 
time to spend on things that are, are basically their first choice. So the, the uh, net, if you will, the big takeaway, I think, from this needs assessment is to say that many aspects of the program that we got gathered data on were well received by the various stakeholders we spoke to. Uh, all of them are worthy of uh, more in-depth consideration, but we think that the list that we've come up with here is a pretty good place to start. And some of these things are well within the uh, expertise of the employees of the Norfolk Public Schools to consider internally. Uh, in other words, I don't think it necessary that the Center for Gifted Education at Wayman Mary be, re be responsible for looking at everything. On the other hand, there are some aspects that are uh, better uh, to be looked at by people outside the school district. Uh, and you can imagine the reasons why. Part of, it is, part of it is expertise, but part of it is that people who work within schools sometimes um, operate with some limitations on what they can do in terms of gathering data and so forth and the people they're working with, because quite often they're gathering data from people they know who are their friends and colleagues. So, so there's a reason sometimes for objectivity that comes from outside work. On the whole, uh, our take is that the schools at, uh, in the Norfolk Public Schools gifted programs, the people who've organized these and have run these deserve credit. They're, um, they're very uh, ambitious in trying to uh, reach out, identify, and serve uh, as many high ability and gifted kids as, as possible. And I think they should be applauded for this effort. Anytime you do something of this scope as it pertains to gifted kids, there's going to be an ongoing need to continuously improve things. That's where I think the schools are at this point. And Jennifer and I and Dr. Paul would be happy to try to address any questions you may have. Thank you uh, to both Dr. Cross, Dr. Tracy Cross and Dr. Jennifer Cross for their assistance with the needs assessment as well as for presenting this afternoon. And at this time, as Dr. Tracy Cross just said, we're happy to entertain questions from the board. Are there any questions? Mr. Jordan and then Dr. Gabriel. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the for the presentation and the work. Uh, a few things. One, can you can you go back to the slide? Uh, maybe it was one of your earlier slides when you were showing the different levels of uh, of evaluations. Uh, at that time, uh, I thought it was I thought you shared that it was agreed to do a level one. Can you describe the the process of how it was determined to do level one and uh, maybe what the uh, scope of work was that um, that you had from Norfolk Public Schools in terms of this evaluation process. Um, I can speak to that to some extent. Jennifer, please feel free to chime in as you'd like. Um, when you when you come into a large school district that has so many moving parts to it, um, it's very expensive in time and energy to evaluate say a level three, or what is sort of the Cadillac version, if you will, would probably be a combination of these three levels. So you might call that a level four that attempts to get all these things in a developmental manner. It was decided that at that time, the administrators had a pretty good sense of certain aspects of the program and of programs and how well they were going. And there were other areas where they had some concerns you know, they've gotten feedback from parents or other stakeholders, but they weren't certain uh, where things were. And uh, as a consequence of the time and the money and the feedback and data they had already collected, they felt like the getting a database sort of guide on um, where to train more in-depth analyses made the most sense at that time. So that's why level one was chosen in a nutshell. Um, Jennifer, do you want to speak to the kind of data collected and so forth in the group? She did do that in your presentation, but do you want to mention it in this context? No, I don't think so. I think that might it might be Carla Stead would want to make a comment. Ms. 
Stead about how we chose to do that? You were part of that conversation, I believe. Uh, I would be happy to chime in. The conversation regarding how we chose the people, the stakeholders to survey? No, the how, uh, needs assessment versus doing an evaluation, doing level one as opposed to level two or three. Yeah, I think Dr. Cro Trace, Tracy Cross, I think explained it well. We sat at the table with uh, Dr. Rogers at the time was the chief academic officer um, with Dr. Cataldo, myself, um, ARA was there, Dr. Bailey, and we had a, a thorough discussion on the different levels. And we talked about the different aspects of each level. And we decided as a good starting point was to find out, is there really a problem that is, um, how, how big is the problem? We've heard some perceptions some parents that have expressed concerns, especially you know, from our advisory committee, as well as parents uh, you know, reaching out to various principals or to our department. And so I think our first goal was, is how prevalent is these perceived issues. And so it made sense to just start off with just doing an evaluation on a level one aspect. You came with the proposal of all three levels. And I think we started with this level to see what the results were before we decided to move on to a more deeper evaluation, the level two. And that was the goal with the idea knowing that our local plan was going to be coming up for renewal the next summer. And this would help us as we reevaluate how we provide gifted services in the district. So I hope that answers your question. Thank, thank you. I, I want to come back to that in a second. Then the mm -hmm. other uh, item I just want to maybe bring some personal attention to. So in the presentation, um, you noted that um, the program at Rosemont is the only, I guess, yeah, how you described it, uh, program that is specifically designated for students who are identified as gifted. I'd like, uh, like for you to expand upon that some, and also um, um, you also have in there the specialty programs. So I have concern about the specialty programs being conflated with uh, gifted services because I think there's already a misperception out there, at least I consider a misperception, that in order to participate in our specialty programs, that one has to be identified as gifted and I know that part of what, uh, as a board, that we were working on when we first started talking about having this um, evaluation done, which I'll come back to in a minute, is uh, doing a much deeper dive and looking at barriers to access, making sure that we have uh, uh, equity that's being involved, making sure that we have pathways, that we aren't creating barriers and other things, you know, even beyond the whatever recommendations that, we, that we've received from, uh, from, from the GAC. But I'd just like to get a, maybe the administration can help with this as to what is the, why do we have the specialty programs listed as part of the, the gifted services needs assessment? So I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, give a, a start of an answer to that for you, Mr. Jordan. I don't, when I read through the needs assessment and looked through this, I don't think they were listed as a as a gifted program, but as an opportunity for gifted students that they could still go. Like the IB program, even though it's open for all, those are higher level courses that, that could also um, serve our gifted population. So it's not by, and I 100% agree with you that those, those are not gifted programs. They're just high academic programs that um, and especially programs that any student could could uh, apply and, and be a part of. But those were just my understanding of reading through this and, and speaking with Dr. Cross, Dr. Cross and uh, Ms. Stead was those were included as an opportunity for gifted students to be able to partake in as a, as a rigorous option. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just think it's important uh, for us as we talk about, at least at the, at the governance level, that um, that we don't, that we dispel the, the perception and the myth that uh, that our specialty programs are not accessible uh, to all. And then just going back, I'll just say to Dr. Birdsong and, and to the board, uh, I think we should consider having a deeper evaluation. I think we were working on the accountability plan uh, some time ago, and we were looking at the um, uh, some of the other, uh, we, we did a specialty plan audit, we were looking at special ed, we are looking at uh, trying to provide these pathways that we consider uh, doing a, a deeper evaluation uh, so we can get to 
some of these other areas that align with uh, the goals that we have. Thank you. And Mr. Jordan, if, if I may, I agree with you 100%. Um, as, as you know, you know, um, I, I was not serving as superintendent at, at that time. There are other members of the administration who are, are new in their roles as well. Um, but as we reviewed uh, the results of this um, needs assessment, we too agreed that we wanted a deeper dive. So um, we are certainly um, interested in, in moving that work forward. We were also very concerned about a low participation at, at the, the building levels and so, or at the building level. And so we would certainly want to go back to ensure that, you know, we have um, good representation from all of our schools so that there's not a misconception that the, the results are somehow how skewed. So we received that and, and we agree with you 100%. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gabriel and then Ms. Basim. Thank you, um, Chair Martin, Dr. Birdsong, and the members who um, participated in the study. This is a uh, long overdue and muchly anticipated report. I know for many of the families, um, especially those who um, receive gifted services and are very vocal about um, wanting to have uh, these items reviewed. So I appreciate uh, the report. I appreciate the candid um, responses of those who participated. I did note that at, at all of the gifted resource teachers, um, the individuals who are most close to the students and providing the services did participate. And so when I do look at this report, um, I, I, I can uh, agree with uh, Dr. Birdsong and Mr. Jordan about wanting to take a deeper dive, especially with the uh, members who participated, uh, making sure we have a good pool of those uh, members getting surveyed. But I think that we have some good, solid recommendations for next steps. So my question um, will be, knowing the information that we have um, with the recommendations presented before us, how does the uh, administration feel about um, items that would be uh, recommended with regards to budget, policy, professional development? Are there definite low pieces of low-hanging fruit that you think that you can um, accomplish or items that you can recommend to the board? So I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Stead, uh, Dr. Gabriel. Um, one is professional development. Um, when, this, when this report came back, Ms. Stead um, with her team and, and Mr. Brady and, and others had started already developing a professional development plan for DRTs and for teachers, um, because that was definitely something that was noted is that, um, you know, the resource of professional development for our teachers is, is vital for our program. Um, so that's definitely a low, low hanging piece of fruit that we've started working on. Uh, of course, the, the shutdown in March changed tune a little bit, but we are still on top of that. And, and, and Ms. Ted is working with professional development with our, our folks as well. Um, the, you know, I think internally we can do an audit of, of resources and funds of what we spend on gifted um, and where we place our gifted teachers. I know uh, when the placements for this year came out, Ms. Ted had taken some of that into thought as well. Um, so, of course, we're looking at those low of uh, as you said, to, to grab onto and make sure that we're um, moving this work forward. Ms. Dead, if you wanted to mention a couple other things, I know that GIAC had worked with some suggestions that you had have put into place as well. Uh, that's correct. Um, so yes, every year we do an annual assessment and we send in our recommendations to the board and the last set of recommendations, a lot of them we could uh, we were attempting to handle, and unfortunately, the pandemic kind of put a hold on them, but we were making some progress uh, with some collaboration with our counselors, especially at the secondary level. Um, and we will continue to move forward with that because the social emotional issues, especially with the intense workloads uh, that our gifted students uh, take on in high school certainly needs attention. And that is something we were working on. Um, communication is something that we are always working on, and we are trying to work uh, more as a district, it becomes very, uh, it's not, it's disjointed to say the least at this point, it's getting better. Um, so we're doing a better job at trying to come to making the communication at the district level to make those opportunities. Uh, they're not, it's not that they're not available. <clears throat> it's just that they're not as known and 
a lot of parents and, and students are unaware of the many things that we do offer at Norfolk Public Schools. So that is an ongoing thing that we are, we are continually working on to get communication more from the district level to make our events and opportunities um, gifted or not gifted for any high ability students willing to who wants to take a, a step further in, in advancing whatever academic area or gift they want to pursue. And so that is something we can continue to work on as well. And with the support of administration and the board would be certainly helpful. Um, certainly a lot of, we would, we would like a gifted resource teacher at every school, but we understand the budget constraints. But I think that in the long run that would assist, especially at our, uh, schools where maybe those numbers aren't as high on paper, but we know there are plenty of gifted students or potentially gifted students that need the extra support. Um, as Dr. Cross and uh, mentioned, there is certainly potential at every level, um, but we we need to instead of just identifying, we need to then service those tier two and tier three students accordingly. And uh, just the label itself is is not going to do the do the work. So, you know, if I could ask for anything, it would be more gifted resource teachers so we could have a full-time one at every school so we can build those relationships and build a more cohesive program at each school because each school has its own separate culture and, and climate and so forth. Um, Thanks, Ms. Stead. Um, so uh, I have, um, Ms. Campson and then Ms. Basine. Actually, uh, Dr. Martin, I think that Ms. Basine was on the list last time before my name came up. So oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Ms. Basine and then Ms. Campson. Thank you. Okay, for thank you. Me. Oh, thank you, Ms. Campson. Um, thank you uh, to William and Mary, Dr. Cross, and Dr. Cross um, for your presentation. Uh, today, I mean, it's been it's it's certainly been a long-awaited, um, you know, presentation. Um, I do want to support, you know, what Miss Stead said. You know, we the the GAC has provided, um, you know, pretty detailed reports over the last couple of years that have itemized some of the the needs that have been outlined here. So it's great to hear. Um, how the needs assessment and reinforces what the GAC has um, has put forth in their recommendations in their annual reports uh, to the uh, to the school board. Um, a couple of things. I, I too was under the impression that we were doing a deeper dive um, in this audit, and as part of that, um, you know, I I guess I feel. Um, like I would like to learn more how how our gifted programming in general how it fits into um, our um, you know how it fits into our equity uh, you know looking at it through an equity lens looking at it through a um, even in terms of how who and how is do, uh, is gifted being identified like by who who is defining what maximum um, potential is and what is that I mean there's a lot of amb ambig ambiguity in gifted programming and how children are identified in some ways that I feel like we are creating barriers uh, for for some students without really understanding what it is we we hope to provide because I'm not sure and I think the the needs assessment and even those of us who've been advocates for gifted programming for for years are like what is it that we what is the what are the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve um, because a lot of what I'm hearing is you know we want rigorous classes for our students for our high ability students whether they're gifted or not gifted and I think we as a board have to decide what is it that we're um, aiming to do I mean, we could say put gifted resource teachers, which I have, as, as many of you know, I've said every budget season, you know, let's put a gifted resource teacher at every school. But I feel like if we don't know what gifted education should look like in our schools, then what is it that we're hoping to achieve by uh, putting that resource in place? What if, I, I feel like we need to, as a division, reimagine what gifted education is, or is it really gifted education, or is it reimagining education period, an individualized program for every student 
uh, regardless of race, zip code, because we know there are inequities. Every division across, you know, America is is talking about these inequities, um, and gifted education is is part of that. And so, I really want us to take that deep dive and really think about what it is we mean by gifted education, because it should not be further segregating our students within schools or within uh, the district as a whole, which we know is already, um, you know, battling with segregated schools, period. And we see that with the way our gifted resources, resource teachers are allocated to these schools. So I think it's it really, you know, I would like to encourage us to really take that deep dive uh, into what it is we hope to achieve. I know there are districts and I know there's going to be a, a big gasp, uh, especially coming out of my mouth. But do, do is gifted programming really what we should be focusing on? And how can we put those resources into advancing um, advanced placement program? Uh, classes for, for all students? How can we provide opportunities at the elementary level, which we know based on this um, evaluation, as well as we've been getting year after year from our GIAC members, you know, which at the elementary level has seemed non-existent. You know, could we do project more project-based learning for all of our students? I mean, there's so many things that we could be thinking about to reimagine, um, um, you know, rigorous programming for all students that doesn't have to come with that label of gifted um, attached to it, especially when the definition seems to be a bit nebulous. Um, so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, I know that covered a whole whole range of things, but I, I would like for us to really think about that um, as a division uh, going forward. So thanks. Hey, Ms. Basin, go ahead, Ms. Campson. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, thank you um, to the to our uh, guest who, who did the initial evaluation, not evaluation, but the needs assessment. I'm glad you started with the needs assessment because it's it's a screening that allows us to now dig into the deepness that every, everyone's suggesting, and we certainly do need to do a deep dive. But the needs assessment is what we always need to start with, and it's given us a lot of information. Um, you know, I was a principal for a long time. I worked with fabulous, well-trained, gifted resource teachers. They were often overwhelmed. They were stretched too thin. The idea of having a gifted resource teacher in every building has always been a dream that we push for, um, and, and it's better than it used to be. But the funding, the funding, the funding, what is always our problem in public schools is inadequate funding uh, given to us by our governments. So that's certainly something, but I would like to just hit one item. And, and when we talk about equity, it's something that's very important. And what's, what I saw happening, and we tried to compensate for it, was the fact that they do that screening in January. Uh, Dr. Paul, they still do the, the general screening in, in, of first graders in January? It's that's February. Still, February, Ms. Campson. February, Jerry, yeah. It's the winter time, <laughs> okay? Um, but what I noticed, and, and we all started noticing, is that, you know, we have a lot of high poverty children, and they're not always exposed to what you need to be exposed to to get identified by that screening test. And so, and, and really, it was certainly nothing from me, but from a crackerjack uh, gifted resource teacher. And so what we did for the first half of the year is we provided activities that are, this is just one way you can do something to compensate activities that were similar to the kind of activities that they would be asked to do during that screening test uh, mid-year. Uh, and it was amazing what a difference that it made, which shows you how these, how smart these kids were, but it was masked by their circumstances. And so we really went after that so that we were not, I can't say we caught them all, but we caught many, many more. But oftentimes then they hit another wall when they went for the more in-depth uh, testing. The screener just gives you initial identification, then they do the more testing to actually identify you. And so that's something that I think that I'd like us to, uh, uh, an avenue that I'd like us to look at when we start going in deeper. How do you really get the kids ready for the test? We know that testing is often discriminatory toward our poor kids. That that's no, I mean, that's in everything. That's no, you know, explosion of new knowledge. 
but how can we continue to do something like that? And that was having good, I mean, the gifted teachers are always so good and so creative, um, but it was a good idea coming from there because they were seeing the problem too and, and they were seeing children that needed more help. And it was just integrated in the way that teaching was happening in those classrooms co-done by the classroom teacher and the gifted teacher. So just an example of what you can do. It didn't cost any more money for us to do that, but it had a big impact on helping us to identify a lot of our high poverty kids who were whose, whose intellect was being masked by their circumstance. So once again, thank you. This is great. This was well, as everyone said before, this is something we've been needing. And I think it's a really good start on where we're going. You did a great job. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Kimson. I really like what I'm um, hearing about this, the integration of the um, advanced, you know, the, um, the curriculum, the advanced curriculum to truly see exposed children, but also, you know, really test their limits. And, um, and I think that's something that I'd always been um, a little confused about, about is gifted really integrated in the program and they write, you know, those students who meet certain criteria, then get identified, or is it a completely separate program? And I think that that's something that maybe that needs to be included with the communication. So I'm just speaking like as a, as a parent and, and also as a board member, I've learned obviously a lot more about it. Um, but, um, but it just, I think to the po general population um, that it just would seem like, oh, well, that's just for those other kids when it, we obviously we're saying it's not, it's for children, you know, most, we, to be able to expose all children to the possibility of, um, you know, like we always talk about raising the floor and the ceiling, and we don't want to miss the opportunity for some students to um, really show their, reach their full potential by um, having parents misinformed about it as, you know, being a separate, completely separate from what they're already experiencing in the classroom. Um, I think I saw Ms. Basine's hand up. Did you have something else to say? Uh, no, I didn't. Thanks. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, um, thank you again to doctors uh, Jennifer and Tracy Cross. I appreciate all of the work that you put into this this program over the last couple of years, and um, and the partnership with William and Mary to uh, to get us started. <laughs> on the about the assessment and, and hopefully next step sounds like we're going to um, do a deeper dive with the evaluation. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, we have the um, school resource officer program presentation. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Martin, um, Dr. Gibson is going to get us started with the presentation. And um, as you know, we posted two board docs, the presentation as well as a draft copy of the MOU um, that has been um, collaboratively developed with um, Norfolk Public Schools, um, the city attorney's office, and then the city of Norfolk's Norfolk Police Department. So uh, Dr. Gibson, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Birdsong. Good evening, School Board Chair Martin, Vice Chair Jordan, Superintendent Birdsong, and School Board members. It is a pleasure to share the School Division's proposed Memorandum of Understanding with you this evening. The partnership between Norfolk School Board and the City of Norfolk to provide police officers in our secondary schools has proven to be a viable entity that supports the well-being and development of our students. We will begin with the review of the history of the SRO program, provide some historical data from student and staff climate surveys, share the components of the memorandum of understanding, and provide you the opportunity to hear voices from the field that will include the principal of Norview Middle, Mrs. Brandy Smedley, and SROs, Robert Williams and Shelton Davis. Following the presentation, we will field questions as you lead the discussion of the proposed MOU. Let's begin with our senior coordinator of safety and security, Mr. Timothy Mallory. Mr. Mallory. All right. Uh, good evening, uh, School Board uh, Chair Martin, uh, Vice Chair Jordan, uh, Superintendent Dr. Birdsong, and School Board members. I'm Tim Mallory, Sr., and I'm excited to be back here in Norfolk Public Schools as a senior coordinator for uh, safety and security. Uh, for many years, the uh, community's police officers have had a role and a presence in our schools in both the elementary and secondary levels. Uh, police have been in schools long before the beginning of the SRO program. 
there was the uh, Officer Friendly uh, program, which was a partnership with Sears and Roebuck, the FBI, local police, and the school district. Uh, this was a national program that introduced police officers to elementary schools to establish a rapport between the students and the uniform officers. The DARE program, uh, which was the uh, Drug Abuse Resistance Education uh, program, was in Norfolk schools in the 80s and 90s. And I also served as a DARE officer. Uh, the program was designed to assist students in making good decisions related to drug use and peer pressure. Uh, the school resource officer program began in 1999 uh, when there was an expansion of the program across the nation in response to school shootings. Uh, as the SRO program has evolved in Norfolk, our Norfolk police officers have partnered with school, the school division and the community to build a positive program that provides a valuable resource uh, to the community. Uh, specifically in, in Norfolk Public Schools, the Norfolk Police Department has developed support programs for EL students after school chess clubs to connect with any student who's interested in playing chess. To ensure SROs are prepared to work in, in the school settings, uh, the state of Virginia's new legislation requires all officers to participate in the SRO certification. All but one officer with the SRO program in Norfolk have attended the SRO certification. The other officer is scheduled to attend. Uh, all SROs attend the annual Virginia School Campus Safety Conference to share information, uh, to hear presenters on best practices to improve school safety. In Norfolk Public Schools, a school resource officer is a sworn law enforcement officer who is issued and who carries all the same equipment they would have in any other law enforcement assignment. School resource officers in Norfolk Public Schools possess excellent interpersonal skills that allow them to work with all stakeholders throughout the school community and the city. Part of the school's climate survey included questions about the SROs in schools and I'll share responses from the survey to provide more insight to the presence of the school support in, in, the, in our school setting. Our results from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services show that throughout the state of Virginia, an average of 74% of students indicated the SRO made them feel safer in school. 63% of school, sa school staff sadly agreed that having an SRO in school made them feel safer. 23.7% uh, of the staff somewhat agreed and 10% of staff sadly disagreed that having SROs in schools made them feel safer. All students in all subgroups expressed the presence of SROs in schools uh, made them feel safer. The 2019 uh, Virginia School Climate Survey for Norfolk uh, reported responses for middle schools. Uh, there were responses from 2,134 students, 343 teachers and staff from the middle schools, and 71% of the respondents indicated the SRO made them feel safer at school. <clears throat> 74 74% of middle school teachers and staff agreed to some extent that the SROs made them feel safer at school. Eighty-four percent of teachers and staff in middle schools indicated that the SRO made positive contributions uh, to their schools. For high schools, the 2020 Virginia School Climate Survey for Norfolk reported responses from 788 students. 365 teachers and staff from five high schools. Overall, 56% of respondents indicated the SRO made them feel safer at school. Also from the five high schools, 75% of teachers and staff agreed at some level that the SRO made them feel safer at school. 88% of high school teachers and staff indicated the SRO made positive contributions to the school settings. 
working with the city attorney's office, the Department of Student Support Services has drafted a memorandum of understanding that aligns with the uh, state guidelines for the 2021-2023 uh, years. Uh, today, we will present the memorandum of understanding to you for your review and approval. The memorandum of understanding between Norfolk Public Schools and the city of Norfolk is made to ensure collaboration and promoting safety in the city secondary schools. Currently, each of the five high schools, the alternative schools, and each of the middle schools have school resource officers. Uh, the partnership's mission is to foster an environment of cooperation and safety uh, conducive to effective learning. The success of the SRO program is based on trust and cooperation among the SROs, school administration, school staff, security staff, and students. The SRO, the SRO should act as a visible active law enforcement officer throughout the school building and campus. The SRO will not participate in school discipline. School discipline is the responsibility of school administration and staff. The SRO will report directly to the appropriate Norfolk Police Department commanding officer or designee, abide by all school administration policies unless those policies conflict with the existing laws or Norfolk, Public school, Norfolk Police Department's policies and procedures. Use only one's rank and last name in all contact with students. Coordinate efforts and activities with the principal and administrative secu security staff, excuse me, in developing strategies to prevent and or minimize hazardous situations and complete reports and forms in accordance with Norfolk Police Department and Norfolk Public Schools policies. Roles and responsibilities of the SRO and school administration are clearly defined. The SRO will not conduct duties that school staff and or administration are responsible for. The SRO shall attend staff meetings, share and discuss problems and solutions on a regular basis during those staff meetings. The SRO will work to foster an atmosphere of trust and cooperation. The law enforcement in regards to criminal activity is the responsibility of the SRO. Administrative and disciplinary matters are the responsibility of the school administration. SROs will be evaluated uh, annually by the Norfolk Police Department with input from Norfolk Public School Administrators. An evaluation tool has been developed for Norfolk Public Schools uh, administrators to complete and to submit to the commanding officer each year before the deadline. Each school will provide the SRO with a work area that provides privacy and access to technology. Each SRO will complete and submit required forms and reports as required by the Norfolk Police Department and Norfolk Public Schools policies and procedures. Operational procedures along with roles and responsibilities will be covered uh, annually with the uh, school administration to ensure procedures are known and followed. The school division and the Norfolk Police Department will review annual SRO evaluations to ensure ratings are acceptable and the relationships between the SRO and the school community are conducive to maintaining trust and cooperation. Once approved, the MOU will be signed and submitted to the superintendent of schools, notice to the city and to the city manager. This MOU will be in effect from January 1, 2021 through January 1, 2023, or until such time as Norfolk Police Department and or Norfolk Public Schools amend or revokes it. I had an opportunity to interview several Norfolk police officers who serve our schools as school resource officers, and they shared stories and testimonies that don't make the state book or the news. Now, I'd like to share just a few for you to see and hear from these officers. Uh, these officers of experience range from nine to 24 years as police officers and four to 17 years as school resource officers. Uh, when an SRO received information that a student was threatening suicide, and two of the SROs responded to the residents of the student and were able to assist in providing services for the student. Both of these officers are trained in crisis intervention. 
One SRO expressed when he shops for school supplies for his own children, he buys extra supplies to keep in his office for students. In lieu of charging students, SROs work to mentor and identify diversion programs. SROs provide students with uh, barbershop and salon certificates through a community partnership. SROs have opportunities to work with parents, students, and administration in, re in resolving problems. We have Officer Taylor who serves as a wrestling coach at both Azalea Gardens and Booker T. Washington. Through an investigation at school, an SRO identified that a student was overwhelmed by substance abuse and, and was able to assist in getting that student uh, connected to services. SROs work with parents and counselors to seek solutions for students in need of services. And I want you to listen uh, to some testimonies from uh, two of our SROs, which will be followed by uh, Voices from the Field by Norview Middle School Principal, Ms. Brandy Smedley. Um, and we're gonna uh, view the video now of Officer Davis and Officer Williams. My name is Robert Williams. I've been on the police department for about 22 years coming this January 20, oh, excuse me, this uh, January 19th, 2021. And I've been a school resource officer at Norview High School for the last four and a half years. Okay, and what makes uh, the job as a school resource officer special to you? Getting to know the kids is the best part of it for me. Uh, you know, a lot of them come from different backgrounds and different uh, upbringings and different things like that. And some of them live in certain neighborhoods that have to deal with the police a lot. My goal is to show them that what they see from the media is not really how it is with every police officer who has looked that bad. Okay. So uh, outside of your, uh, in addition to your law enforcement duties, um, what activities have you participated in uh, at your school? Uh, I do the uh, Virginia First. Okay. Uh, whenever the the kids have the uh, football games, basketball games, I attend. Uh, mostly working, but there's been times where I have come not working just to show certain kids some some support. Okay. Because. A lot of them talk to me about not having that home support and different things like that, and that really means something to me. My name is uh, Officer Sheldon Davis. My years as a police officer is kind of split up. I have a total of 26 years as a police officer, um, three years at Hampton University as a police officer, and 23 years as a police officer in the city of Norfolk. I've been a school resource officer for a combined time of seven years. What makes this job special to you? Well, the job, it gives me the opportunity to uh, mingle with the youth, which is uh, something that I like to do. Um, I picked, I picked uh, the SRO program because of that. Um, if, if you're nice to kids, th then they usually give you information even though the SRO program is a combination of police work, it's police work and um, getting to know the kids. One of the positive situations is, um, again, um, communicating with the kids, finding out um, what their problems are. A lot of times it's not always, uh, they don't always act up because they just want to act up. They could be acting up because of a situation at home. If you get to know them and find out what their situation is at home, then it, it helps you to um, it helps you to better deal with them. Um, they'll trust you more, and um, if at all possible, in the past I've uh, assisted them in certain things like clothes, a couple of things like money for snacks or whatever, because you know kids work a whole lot better when their stomach is full. Again, when I first got into it, it's because of the kids. So uh, my first uh, place was uh, Lake Taylor Middle School. I decided to assist in coaching track. Um, so I coached track 
with uh, in Lake Taylor Middle School. Lake Taylor High School, I coached uh, track and volleyball. And at Blair, I coached um, track. And at ADL, um, I went over to ADL and uh, coached football for three years. Kids are worth the time. Um, again, just because it appears to be uh, bad behavior on the outside, you have to go further to find out exactly why the behavior is bad. And as a police officer and a coach, um, you know it's a good it's a good thing. It's a good place to be to assist them and being the best that they can be. Okay, thank you. Is there any more to the presentation? Uh, Miss Smedley should be up. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Ms. Smedley, you can get started while she's transitioning. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, School Board Chair Martin, Vice Chair Jordan, Dr. Birdsong, all school board members, and members of the NPS executive team. It is with great honor that I come to you today as the proud principal of Norview Middle School, home of the Navigators. I've had the privilege of working for NPS over the last 21 years, believe it or not, as a teacher and assistant principal and now principal. And I can't state enough the importance of having resource officers, also known as SROs, in our school buildings. Oftentimes, the perceived primary role of these uniformed members is to deter defiance, disorderly conduct, or disruption of the educational process. However, based on my experience, the benefit of having the SRO present is not to show the students the consequences of crimes, but to be another caring adult for students to look up to. After conferring with several of my colleagues, there's a shared understanding that the SROs support the educational process and their presence is essential. SROs serve as informal educators, positive role models, counselors, and mentors. Their positive image bridges that gap between our children and law enforcement. I know that their presence is undervalued at times, but there is no price for the safe, non-threatening school environment they create. I've personally had the opportunity to witness the SRO at Zelia Gardens Middle School take on the job as wrestling coach, as someone just mentioned, when no one else stepped up. And that was driven by his rapport and relationship with the students. And consider the SRO at Lake Taylor Middle School, who took it upon herself to sit with an upset child. And after a brief conversation, that child's tears were replaced with a smile. I watched my own SRO at Norview Middle School walk through the halls, high-fiving students. She sits with them at lunch as they exchange information about making important life decisions and getting good grades, of course. My SRO has even contacted me after hours um, to inform me about incidents that have occurred in the surrounding neighborhoods the night before. This puts me in a better place to prepare my teams to support our children and teachers that it may have been as affected by these incidents. Now, I can go on and on about the intangible benefits SROs bring to the schools on a daily basis, but the most important benefit of the SRO is safety. There is no replacement for the proactive intelligence that the SRO can provide to our staff. The assist, they assist us with protecting the school from any outside threats. The principals in this district welcome an additional educator, a role model, a counselor, a mentor, and we have that in our SROs. The principals understand that the safety and security of their staff and students are of the utmost importance. And we appreciate having a dedicated public servant serving as school resource officers in our buildings. Thanks so much for your attention. And now I return it to you, Mr. Mallory. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to thank our SROs from the Norfolk Police Department and to Ms. Medley for sharing uh, their stories. And thanks to the school board members and Dr. Birdsong for your attention today. Um, at this time, we will answer questions and or allow for some discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mallory and Ms. Medley. I appreciate, um, I appreciate your words about 
um, the SROs and, and, some, and providing some practical experiences. Um, Mr. Clanton and then Ms. Campson and then Ms. Basine. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, and, and thank you all for the presentation. It was, it's interesting when I saw the picture of D.A.R.E. go up, um, I was actually, I have a pile of papers that I've been going through that my mother had kept. And so I actually pulled out here, I've got my D.A.R.E. Um, certificate from 1991, participating in the program in North Public Schools. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Vice Chair. Doing good. You know, honestly, I get into this um, this discussion about SROs. And I understand he embodies the, every aspect of this award as demonstrated throughout his career and work in public education. Is that me? Someone need to be muted. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Clanton. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Um, but you know, I, I know that we're looking at this policy, and I know that there's a lot of outside influence. Um, and a lot of things that we perceive. And I think that um, you all mentioned that. Um, I think that our police department um, over the years, um, and even when we saw a lot of the unrest that was going on um, and with, uh, with Chief Boone, have really made an asserted effort um, to, to, to build those relationships. Some of my former classmates, matter of fact, um, Ms. Mellon, when you talk about that wrestling coach, um, that is one of my classmates who graduated with me from um, uh, you know, who, who came from the, um, right here in Norfolk, graduated from Moria High School. And I know this individual who is very committed as a police officer to giving back to the students there. Um, I also draw a, 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 a connection in the respect in another role um, where I work with Head Start. Um, I see this in a similar way. Head Start would bring the fire department out for our, our little kids who were in pre preschool, you know, your three and four year olds. Um, and I, I didn't understand why it was so important for them to bring the fire uh, fighters out and so that the kids could see them. And one of the firemen reminded me that in many cases, little kids, if they were ever in a situation, when you think about the firemen all in that suit and they had that gas mask on and so forth, it can be very intimidating and scary. So I appreciate the effort and, and the respect that where our police officers and our, our firemen and others in our community and when we talk about equity, bringing everyone together in a respect of being able to service and support our students, um, that we have that opportunity to do that. Now, I say all of that also to, to, to say this. I have said it in, um, in our policy committee meeting um, as we look at this particular item here, and I know that it's a recommendation I think Dr. Paul may talk about, um, that we make sure that we have some stakeholders who are very passionate about this and that we ensure that their voices um, are heard on the front end and not on the back end um, in a public comment session or anything there, but that we actively engage them as we move forward with this particular policy and with the MOU um, um, and that they're, you know, they're at the table because I believe that we all have to, regardless of what's going on around there, around the world and around our country and, uh, and in some of our neighborhoods that we also have to take in respect of what's happening in our own community and look at what's happening here and make also um, those type of assessments. And if it's a good thing, um, and in many of our kids are being, um, and, and I've seen many who, and I, and I will say that I'm one of those, um, who through great mentors, even, you know, and I see, um, and, I, and I'll give an example, Norview High School, those police officers there um, in Precinct 3 actually had a, um, a program before the pandemic was going on where they were working with kids after school. They were getting them ready uh, with, with college and filling out work applications. So there are many things that are going on. Um, and I think that we have to stress the point that SROs do not engage in student discipline. Uh, but that they provide an, a certain um, presence within the building, which I think Ms. Campson's talked about before in the respect of being able to see that there is someone of authority there, um, that um, if any emergency situation, um, that we have that extra level there. So I thank you all. Um, thank you, Mr. Mallory. We're glad to have you back um, in that role. Um, and I intend, and for those who may be watching, I am still open to conversation, but I want us to be able to get on the same page um, and find where we can have compromise to ensure that we can have all of these uh, areas. Oh, my one question in this before I get off here. Who pays for SROs? Because I think there's a misconception about that. Are they on the NPS uh, payroll or are they being paid by um, another entity? The city of Norfolk. Mm -hmm. The sorry. city of Norfolk pays for the SROs. So that's out of the city's budget, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Campson? 
Thank you, Dr. Barton. Um, and thank you, Mr. Mallory. That was a very, very thorough presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, I know that this is, is something of a hot issue now. I, and as an elementary person, didn't have a lot of contact with SROs, except through the DARE program. Uh, loved your certificate, Mr. Clinton. Um, but I know I loved having them in, in the school when they came in because they were a role model that we needed to have our children see in a positive way. Um, and, and certainly we all felt much safer when they were there. I certainly did. Um, instead of being on my own and you know, once being told as the principal, I, I was the security for the building. I was the security officer. It was good to see other security, someone who knew something about more about security than I did. So um, I really appreciated this. I just had one quick question, and it has to do with the evaluation of the SRO. Uh, and I, perhaps our our, our 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 principal that's here could, uh, our secondary principal that's here could let me know. Do you do you uh, do you get to participate? Um, with the police department when it comes to evaluating, because you're the person, you're the administrator on site. What type of, of, of how does that work with the evaluation for the officers in your building? Yes, um, we have an opportunity to evaluate our SROs and um, that does happen on a yearly basis. Um, so we have an opportunity to just share exactly what they're doing in the building, um, how we're able to communicate with them, how, they, how well they communicate with us, so um, that's been beneficial and it's great to have that opportunity to just share um, how well we, you know, work together and communicate. Now, see, that makes me feel really good, too, because that was the question, because um, I've never seen an officer in my building that has not been a positive influence. But I've seen yes. a couple of things on TV that I know uh, cause some concern with some of our parents. And so but if there's someone who has eyes on it right there. Mm -hmm. that if there's any anything underlying going on, they would pick it up. So that, that's yes. that's exactly what I'm happy to hear. Um, so thank you very much for that. And thank you, Mr. Mallory, again. Very good presentation. Thanks, Ms. Campson. Ms. Basine, go ahead. And then Ms. Smith. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mallory, and thank you to the, um, the school resource officers that participated in the video. Um, I have a couple of questions, and this um, might be for Dr. Gibson and Mr. Mallory. Um, I'm not sure, but it's pertaining to the slide, uh, some of the, the data that, that was provided to us. So on slide nine, um, I think it is. I'm sorry, not nine. Um, let me find. We're, we're talking about um, our school climate data. Um, so of the students, uh, for instance, who, so the percentages up are up here of those who agree and strongly agree. And this is something that, you know, I feel like every time we, we do review the, the climate survey, you know, I like to know what the demographic data is uh, for those students. Are we I'd like to know who who thinks who strongly agrees or strongly disagrees um, that they feel that the SRO makes them feel safer at school. I um, mean, I think that's a it's an important question because if we have a predominantly uh, predominant number or percentage of white students who feel safer, but our our black students do not feel safer, that's that's a critically important question that I think we need to to answer and have information around. Um, so as we go forward, I would like to see that type of data, you know, this data broken down by demographic uh, data as we as we go forward and, and assess our climate survey um, data. The other piece is I would like to know, and I, I think I had previously requested this, is how many incidents, and I'd like to see like a school by school report, how many incidents uh, involved an SRO? And I, you know, that's probably not something that you might have at the top, you know, prepared for today, but that's, that's information that I think the school board should be monitoring. Um, if, if SROs are, if we're going to continue this um, relationship with the SROs. Um, and I'd like to see going back how much, you know, how involved, what instances were SROs um, involved in our discipline. Ms. Basine. Going forward, 
we will be able to give you more accurate information regarding SRO involvement in situations that are law violations in our schools because our procedures are changing in a manner that will require us to document and report and log them. So going forward, we will be able to give you that information. Going backwards, I can give you the number of students who received long-term suspensions. Not all of those students were involved with the SRO, even though their their disposition was a long-term suspension. But I cannot give you the past information, but going forward, we will be able to provide that. Okay. Okay, and, and, and if we look back at those students that had long-term suspensions, I think we've all raised the question about the disproportionality uh, that we do see there with our Black students, with our students who have a special education, uh, who have an IEP. Those are all you know, things that we, we have to consider in this decision, decision-making process. Um, so, um, Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Um, but that was the crux of my questions. I do have some comments later, but I'll, I'll let Ms. Smith go ahead. Well, before we go to Ms. Smith, um, the one question that you asked about the demographic data of the survey responses, is that available? Was that collected? I would have to look back at the uh, state data. The state, uh, we, we did share the one slide uh, for the entire state of Virginia. Uh, we talked about all subgroups expressed that the uh, president of SROs made them feel safer at school. Um, I could probably contact the Virginia Center for School Safety and see if they have a breakdown for us uh, for the city of Norfolk. That'd be yeah. great. And if, yeah, if you can um, get that to us, I'd really appreciate that. I think that's an excellent question. Okay, um, Ms. Smith, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Martin, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm pretty much just piggybacking off of Ms. Bassine and Mr. Clinton, something that they said. I, too, would like to know the involvement of the SROs in our schools. Uh, perception provides us with one frame of information um, to draw conclusions, but their actual involvement and the impact within the schools, being able to see this information, uh, along with demographics, it will provide us another um, another view to be able to draw conclusions. On the financial side of it, uh, Dr. Gibson, are you saying that the funding of the 19 SROs that are identified in this MOU with the city are not a Norfolk Public Schools budget line item? Yes, that is correct. The city of Norfolk provides that to the school system. And, okay. and well, well, just ordinary yeah. Norfolk police officers, uh, you know, salaried police officers, and they're paid uh, just as though they were doing ordinary police work by the city. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. And how long have we had SROs in our high schools and middle schools. When did it begin in each of these, just as a whole, not per school, but we started putting SROs in high schools when, and we started putting them in middle schools when? Ms. Smith, I will speak on that um, based on my experiences of working in the schools as a teacher and an administrator. Around 1999, when they were first placed in public schools nationally, Norfolk began to place them in the schools. When I, was in a, when I was a teacher at Norview Middle in the late 90s, we had an SRO in the building. And from that time through all of the rest of my time in Norfolk Public Schools, SROs were present. So the 90s, they were in the secondary schools working as SROs through today. Okay, so about 20 years? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, go ahead. Yes. Um, do you know just about how much uh, the city pays for the SROs? Do you know the number? I could probably find that out. It would be the total salaries of the 19 mm -hmm. police officers, and that would depend on their ranks. Uh, there isn't a special SRO rank. I would guess they're all 
PO1s or PO2s. Okay. But I, I, I would like with, to know the total, yeah, the sum, yeah. Uh, I'll check on that. Okay. Is that all, Mr. C? Okay. Mr. Jordan, did you have a question or comment? Okay. Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Mr. Mallory back. Uh, long time no see. <laughs> I think it was the Safe Schools grant where we may have met uh, 20 years or so. Yeah. So, um, I just would kind of get a, a understanding of what we're discussing here. So the, the presentation I, I gather is um, to encourage the board to continue uh, or to support a SRO program, which, which is fine. Um, if that's the intent, I know at some point we're gonna discuss the, the MOU I uh, would like to fully disclose that um, uh, I think SROs have been were good to my children, uh, even as I see them today. Uh, the SROs seem to know more about what my children are doing, even as they're out of school, than than I do sometimes. So, I don't think there's any question from my perspective in the fact that we've had uh, some very caring adults who have served as SROs um, in our buildings. But I want to go back and, and re-emphasize on the caring adult piece. I'm not sure I've heard um, uh, outside of the, the the fact that the SRO carries the legal authority that that has been mentioned. What would um, make an SRO uh, the determinant, if you will, of a building being safe than some other caring adult uh, that that could be there? Um, I know over time, having volunteered in schools, uh, you know, principals would say or teachers would say, hey, can you just get a group of men to come and uh, be a part of the, you know, have lunch with children or come talk to children? Or can you get some ladies to come and talk to some of our children? So I don't know if the, is the, is the discussion here whether or not we should have an SRO program? Is the discussion, do we need more caring adults in our buildings? Because I absolutely think that we need more caring adults uh, in our in our building, uh, and then when we get to the uh, MOU discussion, I have some more questions. But one thing I'll ask that I didn't see mentioned in the presentation or discussed: we had some pilots going with uh, looking at uh, restorative justice. Uh, you know, I was working with the police department, was part of the uh, implicit bias training in some uh, community groups that. Uh, current Chief Boone and other chiefs have run. What, where are we with our restorative justice uh, program and how would that fit or can that fit in our overarching uh, efforts to have uh, safer and secure, and I think we had more pleasant uh, uh, learning environments? That initiative is still underway, and, and we see that as a, a support of, you know, our total work. So we don't see it as, as separate pieces. And if the board desires a presentation or an update, um, we can certainly have Sophia Almond, who works in our student support services um, department, who leads that initiative. We're happy to um, plan for that. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful because, I you know, I, I appreciate being able to talk about the SRO, pro, SRO program in isolation, but I'm really just trying to see the, the bigger picture of uh, what we're doing, what our strategies are gonna be overall and, and what role the SRO program uh, may play in that. But when we get to the discussion about the MOU in particular, then I have some questions and concerns about the, the MOU specifically. And we will be, um, Dr. Gibson is going to lead a discussion around the MOU, um, um, and Mr. Cloud will also share that as it relates to the MOU, it has to be signed by myself, but it needs to be uh, approved by the board, and we certainly want um, community input and, and things of that nature, but I think, um, it, I believe the timeline would be in January, but that doesn't mean that we can't move forward with securing the input for our, from our community and making revisions and, and things of that nature. Mr. Cloud, do you want to add to that? Well, just to say going forward, uh, part of the new statutory changes requires that the community be involved, not just you know, the initial creation of the new agreements, but also, <coughs> excuse me, the board will have to reaffirm the agreements at least every two years. And that process involves 
I'm sorry, advertising the drafts to the public so that the public can comment on them. And then going forward, your uh, agreements have to be posted on the board's website at all times. So the public can easily see you know, what the, the details of the SRO agreements are and by which the SROs function in the public schools. That's part of the changes to Virginia law that took effect on July 1st uh, or will be taking effect in January. Some of the Board of Education's regulations are, are, are going to be effective in January. So um, I have a question. So are we prepared to talk about the MOU today or do, are you saying that that would be at a later would that Yes, within our agenda planning process, we discuss having a presentation around the program, providing the board with a draft copy of the MOU, and um, possibly having the board to move forward with a, a vote, and, and certainly a timeline for community input as well. Um, I do have one comment. Move forward with a vote tonight. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, even if the board was, you know, unanimous, a majority of the board felt they were comfortable with the current draft, I would still postpone a vote so that it can be again, be on the agenda and uh, reviewed by the public and the public has a further comment. So I would not vote on it tonight. Yeah, uh, we did not plan to vote tonight. Yeah, we'll add it to the um, consent agenda for um, our December 16th meeting. But I do wanna um, add to the discussion, the current, the discussion we're having. And Ms. Smith, I see your hand. I'll, I'll go to you next. Um, we talked a lot about the importance of the relationships between the SROs and the students and the and the, um, the building, the principal and, and teachers and administrators in the building. Um, we briefly talked about the actual policing role that the SROs serve. And um, there was a bit about it in the presentation on, um, on what a deterrent and, and um, an actual officer is outside of the building. And um, I just wanted to add to that, uh, this is something we talked about quite a bit at our safety and safe and secure task force, is um, the importance of, as we do, we have, um, we've had guns in schools, we've had lockdowns, we've had, you know, act real serious um, incidents happening in our schools. And, and while, you know, our, our administrators are constantly running drills, um, and they, when they run those drills, they have the principal and, and, and a, an assistant that are outside, you know, or not necessarily outside the building, but they're monitoring and running that drill with their, uh, within their school. Um, but in a real situation, that would not be occurring. The principal would be um, either, you know, sheltering in place or, or doing whatever's appropriate, depending on the incident that they're that they're um, planning for um, and that you would actually need an officer who is trained in the um, in incident command and um, actually directly tied to um, the police department and the communication infrastructure to be able to you know actually um, respond and get all of those the uh, that whole process um, moving forward uh, fairly quickly, because of course, when you have any type of emergency incident um, in, in anywhere, and particularly in our schools, time is of the essence. And so we need someone that is um, that is trained and to properly um, have that direct line of communication and to get that re response um, to the incident going. So I think that's an important piece that we have, we have kind of glossed over. So um, Ms. Smith, did you have a comment or question? Yes, thank you. I would like to see how this memorandum of agreement differs from the one that we ha currently have in place. So is it possible to get a comparative if this is like a red line version or a change to one that already exists? Is we can share with you the earlier ones. The current ones are, are relatively old. So this is a drastic change. Uh, and partially because the statutory requirements are, are changing dramatically. We're also still waiting. The uh, Center for School Safety has been working on a model uh, agreement, SRO agreement, for some time now. And they still have not published it. But eventually we'll have to look at that and we may have to modify any agreement we put in place depending on, on what's in that. The last I was told a, a few weeks ago was that 
they had completed their draft, but had presented it to the attorney general's office for review. And they were not, they couldn't say when it'll be ready for actual sharing with divisions across the state. I believe that the, this current draft, Ms. Gibson can maybe speak to that, was based initially on a recent agreement from a, a particular city. Am I right, Ms. Gibson? Yes, that's correct. This particular draft was, was adopted from one of the school systems in Northern Virginia who just passed or just finished approving their SRO MOU. It's also an, a blend of the previous MOU in that we took everything that was in the previous MOU and we updated to reflect the 2017 guidelines of the template that's provided on the um, Department of Justice's website. So the components that we put in aligned to, the, to a statewide template. The, it also aligned to a process that had been completed and had gone through a public hearing within the community. From there, we gave it to Mr. Cloud and he shared it with the police department and the police department added and revised its components based on the way the police department operates. And then Mr. Cloud took the two pieces and he adjusted and updated based on the current laws and the legislation that we have to follow. So right now, what we have is the most current draft in that we use the 2017 template. Once we put our draft in place and we approve it, we start working with it and we get a new template, then we will have to revisit our MOU with those three entities, the city, the legal um, advice, and the school board's um, development of the MOU so that we can have a document that's current and up to date. I will email copies to the board of the current uh, SRO agreement. You, you will see the 2014 S, um, MOU included the, a number of schools that the police department would provide services for. It also explained that discipline and police matters were different and that there would be training and an understanding between the two where the administration would ensure that school matters were handled by the school and in terms of working with students, laws were followed so that students' constitutional rights would be protected. The new MOU goes into detail where students have to be with an administrator. Students also have to be told their rights in a manner that they understand based on their developmental age. Also, um, we have to make sure that students understand that they have the right to not talk Students must be with an administrator when they are talking or interacting with the Norfolk Police Department. If a student is interviewed or detained by the police, parents ought to be notified and contacted beforehand, unless of course there's imminent danger or something is happening that endangers everyone's safety. You'll see the, um, the, the MOU we're sharing with you now stipulates that people's rights have to be honored, people have to be treated with courtesy and respect, and there are procedures in place if someone does interact with the police, parents have to be notified, forms have to be completed. We also have to log and monitor anything that we do in terms of students having to have charges placed against them. But our goal in working with students in terms of the restorative practices is that we're hoping to work in a matter where the school can resolve the issues with its PBIS programs and its Virginia tiered systems of support. We're in the business of helping our children grow, to learn from um, mistakes and to have teachable moments. And the police are not there as they would be if they were working at something in the public. The school is a different place. It's a sanctuary. Ms. Pachin, Ms. Ms. Martin. Uh, Mr. Jordan, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. And uh, uh, administration or maybe attorney Cloud, just explain again what the statutory requirements are. So Current, we have, we have an SRO program, uh, MOU. If we have an MOU, we continue with an SRO program. If we don't have an MOU, we don't continue. The law is saying, what? can you just kind of explain the, 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 the legal and the policy pieces associated with the SRO program 
providing security in our schools and the, and the MOU. Well, if, if you if you want to continue the SRO program, then we have to execute a new agreement consistent with the new requirements. Excuse me. Uh, but you don't have to have an SRO program. Uh, and of course, whether to have one is not entirely up to the school board. It's also a decision of the cities. So there has to be some agreement between the two as to you know, how it'll function. But uh, it's, there's certainly no legal requirement that you have an SRO program. Right, but is the SRO program the only means by which security can provi be provided in a school building at the secondary level? Uh, well, you're, it's the only means whereby you could have law enforcement officers in the schools, yes. You, you could have law enforcement officers responding to emergencies in the schools, but to actually have a law enforcement officer in a school, it would, under current law, have to be an SRO. Uh, your security guards, uh, for various reasons, their ability to function as law enforcement officers was taken away some years ago. School security guards cannot, they do not have law enforcement officers' powers and they can't be given them. Thank you. Um, Ms. Smith and then Ms. Bassine. Oh, thank you. Mr. Cloud, the um, draft template that you were mentioning or draft SRO agreement or requirement, is that a published draft? Uh, yes, I believe so. Ms. Gibson probably has a clean copy of it. It, it is the SRO agreement of a particular city. I think it was Alexandria, but uh, I didn't get it. That was uh, presented to me by uh, the administration. Uh, I, I, we, can, we can get it and get a copy to you. It is the agreement of a particular city. Yeah, I would like to see the one that we currently have in place just to see the changes because I'm interested in the changes, even if they're by law, that have taken that since our last agreement. And then I think it would just be good for us to uh, knowledge wise to have the template that's um, a draft for others to use. Um, I, I can share the template from the Justice Department yeah. and I can share the sample that Alexandria used to develop its MOU. And then you, you have our draft of what we are proposing. And we have the 2014 MOU for Norfolk Public Schools. We can provide those instruments for you to review. And just to be clear, that template that Ms. Gibson is referring to is about to be outdated. That is the current one, but several years ago, the Center for School Safety was directed to prepare a new one, which they have done and presented to the Attorney General's Office for review. It's not clear when that's going to come out, and uh, it may well not be available till sometime next year but it will be a new template and it will replace the one that Ms. Gibson is talking about. Essentially, the General Assembly took from the uh, uh, Department of Criminal Justice Services the uh, authority to do the template and gave it, they created this new entity, the Center for School Safety and tasked them with the job of creating a new model agreement for SROs which they have now done, but it's still got to be reviewed and approved by the Attorney General. And as soon as that comes out, we'll also share that with the board. So no doubt Gibson to the one from Alexandria and the, the current template, only yes to what we are changing. Similar to what we do with other um, policies or agreements, just where are we transitioning from so that as a board just have an understanding of what this current MOU is implementing that we did not have before or what may be coming out that we had in it before. Okay, let me make sure I uh, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. 
the current MOU, you would like to see that to compare to what we are proposing so that you can see the differences in what the new MOU has that the old MOU did not have. Yes. Okay. And the, the big pieces in the new MOU deal with restraint and seclusion guidelines, students' civil rights, parent permission, release of information, making sure that students' rights are protected at all times. They have the representation of the school, the building administration when they interact with police officers in, in any type of matters where the police officers may need to speak with them. Police officers do not come to school to arrest or interview children. Um, or, or staff, that is to be done for the most part outside of the school day. If it is done and there's something where they need to take a child into custody, it is done in a very discreet manner so that that child's dignity is respected. Parents are notified. Um, people can't just come talk to our children and leave and parents not know. Parents are notified before it starts. The administrator stays with that child. Um, once a child is officially arrested by the police department, the picture does change, which is why, um, and that's also listed in the current MOU. And that is why it is important for administration to know and follow through on contacting parents from the very beginning of any type of interactions and making sure that we're working with our families to protect our children. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Ms. Bassine, and then um, we're going to wrap it up and move on. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, I support, I too, uh, uh, you know, would like to see the old, the current um, MOU and compare it to uh, what we have going forward. But based on some of the changes that I'm hearing in terms of the roles and responsibilities, um, you know, I guess... I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of mixed, uh, I'm getting some mixed signals here about whether we actually would even need the SROs in the buildings or should have them in the buildings. And there's a couple of things, something that, that I think you just mentioned as well too. And I, I picked it up before in watching, um, you know, the videos with the SROs. I'm but, not hearing anything. Is, is that just a Can you all hear me? I'm, I'm unmuted. Sure. We can hear you. Yes, we can oh, hear okay. you. We can hear you. All right. No, I'm um, saying I can't hear um, anyone else. Can you hear Ms. Bassine? No, I, I can't hear Ms. Bassine. Okay. Ms. Bassine, con continue, and, and, and then we'll figure out what's okay. going on with Mr. Cloud. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so again, um, so my question is with the current statutory requirements, you know, how um, is the need for SROs based on what your current understanding is about the roles and responsibilities actually going to play out with the, with the new changes in place? And secondly, you know, if, if it's the students' rights, and again, this might be a question for Mr. Cloud, which is kind of why I was uh, waiting to see if he could hear me. But, um, you know, there was a comment made about trying to get some information about what might be happening in the community. They, it sounded to me like there was some, you know, policing, police work happening while that relationship was being built. And that that's how I, you know, even not only as a school board member, but as a parent, I think that would be a concern for me because now the officer, the law enforcement is building a relationship with a child who, who may, you know, have something going on or maybe suspected of having something going on. And I think that that relationship could get pretty hairy. Um, and, and I would see that that being a, uh, an issue. Um, the other question, oh, I, 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 Dr. Dr. Yeah, I, I wanted to respond to that, Ms. Basine. Um, I know Principal Schmedley spoke to that, and, and I think you misunderstood what she was trying to um, communicate. Basically, what she was trying to say is that building principals often are able to get information about what's going on in the community 
And so they can be proactive. They hear about this information. They're able to put things in place at the school so that even before the children get there, they're prepared to deal with matters that spill over from the community into the schools. And so it's more about, you know, children and their comfort level and, and being able to say to an adult, let me tell you what just happened to me or what, let me tell you what's going on in my, my neighborhood so that building principles can be proactive. And we've got a lot of former building principals on this call, Mr. Fraley, Ms. Campson, Dr. Pohl, and I, I can guarantee you that they can attest to that. That, yeah, and the, that relationship is, is really important. And it's not an abuse of power. It's, it's If anything, it's to ensure a higher level of safety and security for everyone. Right. And, and I, I honestly, um, I wasn't referring to uh, what Ms. Uh, Smedley had, had mentioned. It was specifically in the videos with the SROs um, that played. And so regardless, you know, I could I could see how that situation, though, could arise in that relationship building piece um, with the SRO in the building. And I know that's a concern that has been raised, um, you know, previously by by other parents as well. Um, the other question that I have is, um, if I heard Mr. Cloud correctly, the school board uh, would have to decide whether we want to have an SRO program or not. However, oh, I, I'm hearing Tanya now. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think no, I heard, I... oh, Mr. Cloud, can you hear me? I, I can't hear you now. They're working on this. I just, I've just started hearing you. Okay. Yes. So, so my question was about, um, so the school board has to decide whether they, we want to have an SRO program, but I think I also heard you say that uh, the city, it would also be the decision of the city. Can you, can you speak to what factors, uh, like if the board were to say that we want to discontinue the SRO program, wh under what conditions would the city say, uh, no, you have to have an SRO program. I'm, I'm just assuming that that's what you mean. Um, what what factors would come into play? No, that that's not what I meant. The city okay. can't require you to have an SRO program. Uh, if you don't want one, uh, the city's not going to force one on you, and it, okay. it could not. Okay. What, what I meant was that it's conceivable that you could decide you want requirements of the program that the city felt it couldn't agree to. It couldn't, uh, you know, tie its police officers' hands in that way. Or, you know, a good example would be if you decided you want a lot more SRO officers, because that would be a budget consideration for the city. Uh, so there might be circumstances where you would, uh, you, know, you would want things that the city couldn't agree to, but there wouldn't be any circumstances where the city would, could or would uh, require you to have SRO officers in the schools. That's your decision. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted that clarification. Okay. Thank you, everyone. This is a great there. question. Okay. All right. I'm ready to move on to our next agenda item. Thank you, everyone. I knew that was going to be a, a very, um, very good discussion. So I appreciate that. All right. Next on our um, agenda, we have the Poplar Halls Elementary School Resolution that we'll be voting on at our next business meeting. So go ahead, Dr. Birdsong. Thank you, Madam Chair Martin. And Mr. Fraley is going to lead this discussion. Mr. Fraley. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Martin, Vice Chair Jordan, members of the board, Dr. Birdsong. Uh, we're going to discuss um, relinquishing all control and responsibilities for Poplar Halls Elementary School to the city of Norfolk. We have a draft resolution that I would uh, present to you all this evening uh, by the school board of the city of Norfolk, whereas the educational program at Poplar Halls Elementary School has been relocated to the Lake Taylor School facility. And whereas the school board of the city of Norfolk has no plans to utilize Poplar Halls Elementary School as a school for any children going forward and whereas Poplar Halls Elementary School is no longer needed as a learning center or for any administrative purposes by the school board of the city of Norfolk. And I hereby certify um, that the foregoing resolution was duly and regularly introduced, passed and adopted by the members of the school board for the city of Norfolk at the public meeting of said board on Wednesday, 
December 16, 2020. Now, therefore, be it resolved on December 16, 2020, the school board of the city of Norfolk relinquishes all control and responsibility for Poplar Halls Elementary School to the city of Norfolk. That is the resolution. Okay, Ms. Smith, do you have a comment or question? Yes, I do. How many other buildings do we have in our inventory that can be turned over to the city? Um, at this point in time, we are in our early stages for educational planning, and um, we do not have any current intention of any other resolutions at this point in time. So what brings this one up? What makes this one a priority? This building has been shuttered for two seasons now, um, and it is no longer needed to meet the mission. Okay. And we do have other buildings in our inventory that we aren't currently using that could potentially um, be turned over to the city? We have one other facility that is currently being reviewed for alternate um, operations. And again, we're in the early stages of our ed planning. So uh, we are not ready to uh, declare any usage for that facility at this time. Okay. Um, I have a concern about the resolution, not a major concern about turning the building over to the city. Um, I see this as a pen um, an opportunity for us to expand our focus. Um, we know that as, as a district, we have uh, shortages in terms of our, our um, capital improvement projects. And I'd like us to, as I said earlier, use this as an opportunity to hold discussions with the city in terms of um, potential cost sharing mechanisms or uh, ways that we can come up with a win-win situation when we turn schools or buildings over to them. For example, uh, we will have to discuss it with them. So I would like to see something of that nature a part of a resolution and turning the buildings over where perhaps when we turn over buildings, the sale of that building and land, and yes, I understand that it belongs to the city, but the sale, the proceeds from the sale could potentially go to the district's CIP budget for projects that we have within our district. I'd also like to see us have conversations with the city about tax incremental financing districts, especially in the military circle corridor where Poplar Halls Elementary School is located, where we have a huge plan for development in that area that could potentially help our school district with financing for capital improvement projects uh, within the school district. So that's where I am with this um, resolution. While I support it, I think it's a narrow focus at this time and we need to broaden our focus and have broader conversations with the city that can be beneficial to not only them, but the school district as well. There are current conversations within the uh, city council about sharing the revenues that are generated from the sale uh, or the transference of these properties. I I'm not sure what that percentage of, uh, of our, our, you know, our cut would be, but I am told that that conversation is being facilitated. Thank you. Ms. Bassine, go ahead. Um, uh uh, Ms. Smith asked uh, my question. It was exactly that. Like, how, how can we leverage um, uh, this so that we could get, enhance our, our shared revenue uh, sharing formula? But, all right, thanks. Mr. Jordan? Yeah, I'd just like to know, uh, is, do we have an update on the uh, effort to uh, have the city find a 
location for CSEP so that uh, we can finally complete the process with uh, the old Richard Bowling Elementary School? At this no. time, we have we have no update, no, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just want to, just in light of what uh, Ms. Smith has said, I, I think we've been dealing with that now three years, maybe four years. Can't remember the the exact the exact number. Is it four? Thank you, Mr. Clanton. So, uh, I don't want to say that the two should go together, but but I, but I do think that um, we have to find some way that when at the city's request and at the community's request, we look at consolidation and then we need supports in order for us to continue that process that there's some commitment on behalf of the city to, to follow through on their end. When we had the discussion about Richard Bowling, there was some hesitancy there for that, for that reason. And we were assured that um, we wouldn't be four years in and, uh, and still dealing with, with that matter. So thank you. Yeah. And Ms. Smith, we can make this a topic of our facilities committee meetings if you'd like something we could continue this discussion. Yes, I would. That would be great. And also to something that Mr. Jordan said in terms of consolidation, with the decrease in enrollment that we're seeing as well, which affects the occupancy within our schools, to what extent, and I know you can't answer this question right now, but to what extent could we potentially use existing uh, buildings for the administrative purposes as opposed to a full building that is um, empty? You follow what I'm saying? Like my question earlier- I, I lost you in the middle of it, if you don't mind repeating it. Yeah. So with the, with the decrease in enrollment, which impacts the utilization of our buildings, I'd also like to know to what extent do we have the potential to use part of a building for administrative purposes as opposed to a full building that is not occupied? Well, there's a current practice in place at Rosemont where part of the building is used administratively and part of it is used for the mission of instruction. So that is something that has occurred here in our district. Uh, is there potential for that to continue? We can certainly review that in our future educational planning meetings that we have coming up. Yes, I, I like that taken into consideration because what I'm thinking is there's a possibility of not just um, Poplar Halls being provided to the city, but this other building that remains nameless that could go back to them as well. I, I just think we have to stop looking at things or the perception of looking at things one at a time and looking at things from a broader perspective that is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck but based on how we operate and, and how we expect to continue to operate in the future. Yes, ma'am. And that'll be the focus of the ed planning uh, in cooperation with uh, the cooperative strategies group. We're gonna collectively discuss all the things you've mentioned. We wanna make sure that we are focusing our, our, our efforts for CIPs in the right direction where the attendance continues to grow or is stable um, so that we are, you know, maximizing the, the small CIP budgets that we have. Uh, maximizing a small one and potentially increasing it uh, <laughs> with in collaboration with the city. Yes, ma'am. And, and we have a number of things that we're going to review, um, and, and we will certainly report that back to the board as that process, you know, completes itself. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, um, moving on to our next agenda item, we have our policy discussion. Dr. Pohl, would you like to go ahead? Thank you and good evening again, everybody. Um, tonight, we have a few policies that we're, we're wrapping up through the updates that were provided from February, May, and July from VSBA. Um, there are three that I just wanted to um, or bring your, your attention to specifically. First, 
um, maybe a little bit backwards, but LC we have back on the draft. We did, um, as was recommended, we did put the language back in um, for the three specific areas about applying to charter for, to be a charter school that it won't divert, divert our funds um, and that it will not remove high performing students and that it doesn't um, add liabilities to debt for Norfolk Public Schools. So that was chosen to be put back in. So the only other changes there were made um, based on VSBA recommendations. And we left that part in to keep it Norfolk centric. And also this one, we added the footnote in um, for that piece of the policy. So in the future, folks know that that was added by the board. Um, so there is a, a footnote that, that uh, is connected to that as well. The next one that I wanted to make sure to point out was um, JM. Um, JM, currently Norfolk Public Schools does not have a policy JM. Um, so this would be a new policy for us. The policy is around restraint and seclusion of students. We do not use seclusion in Norfolk, but we have used restraint. Um, if a student needed to be held back or held down to keep from hurting themselves or others, that has been practiced and this would put policy in place. And this policy also requires procedures to be put in place, um, which which we have, uh, which we will have in place with this policy, of course. And the procedures I wanted to point out really talk more about um, PBIS and ways you can really um, um, use positive reinforcement rather than going straight to trying to hold hold back or hold down a student. Um, this policy that's being presented is uh, what VSBA recommends. Uh, for this policy. Um, and the third one I wanted to point out, uh, and also, I'm sorry for Dan, we, we, the school board policy review committee did recommend a first and second reading on that one. And then the final one to point, point out is um, KNAJ, which was uh, focused around what we talked about earlier with the MOU with uh, law enforcement, um, local law enforcement. And the addition here is, is if the local law enforcement agency employees, um, officers in schools, then the board must have an MOU, must be reviewed every two years. Um, and in that review process, it has to have an opportunity for public input during that review period. So those were the ones I wanted to make sure to point out and uh, myself and the policy review committee stand ready for any questions or comments you may have. Any questions or comments? Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bull. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, moving on to our next agenda item um, under it, we're continuing academic affairs and with our discussion of the uh, review of return to school or in-person transition planning. And um, I had sent an email out and I have y'all you know, had a minute had a, to kind of recap um, some of the things that had been we'd been talking about um, and trying to move forward. And um, so I guess I, I listed them out in numbers. And so I just want to, um, I guess, just get started. And so we can go through these. We only have, we do have a hard break in about 12 minutes. And, and I'm happy to come back to this um, after the budget hearing. Um, so I'd like to start with well, what we're, we've been talking about is revisioning, revising our um, our pre previous motion um, and uh, first would be to look at accepting the Virginia Department of Health core indicators as the primary decision making references within the context of both the secondary indicators and the regional core indicators as recommended by the Virginia Department of Health. Um, anyone opposed to that? Any comments? Okay. Dr. Birdsong? I would recommend if, if you're going to move forward with that, a couple of revisions to, to that statement. Okay. Um, I would I would uh, advise you to instead of saying the VDH core indicators, it would be the CDC's okay. core indicators as the primary decision making references within the context of both the secondary indicators and the regional, I wouldn't say regional core indicators, I would say perhaps the regional COVID-19 pandemic metric, metrics as it relates to burden trend and community transition activity, um, transmission activity level as recommended by the VDH. Okay. 
Mr. Clanton and then Ms. Basique. Cool. Um, just a question, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, so you were asking, did anybody have any objections or anything like that? So I, m my question to that is, is um, I know we're not doing anything today because we're this is a work session, but if we're looking at um, the meeting, what is your um, perception of actually to bringing these up? Are we going to vote on each of these items separately as a reconsideration? Because there is a motion in force and effect from the October 21st meeting. Um, or I, I just want to make sure. Well, I'm, we're going to have, I, would, I wanted to have the discussion today and um, yes, possibly uh, piecing these out if we need to. Other, I mean, well, I, 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 we could piece it out or we could put it together if there aren't any other. Well, that, okay. So that second piece of placing it together is where I do have a bit of angst. Um, it would not be appropriate to, to place them together. Um, I don't have a problem doing a vote up but there is motion of reconsideration. There is no replacement type of thing. I've, I've been, I've heard that one time before. I went back and just to make sure that I was on the right page. Um, but we need to vote on those items separately um, because they're all considered motions of consideration and they have to be brought up by an individual who voted in the majority of what we did on the 21st. And then I have no problem with it. I just want to make sure we're doing it right. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jordan, and then Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Bassine, and then Mr. Jordan. It, just, just for clarity, and maybe Dr. Martin, you can restate. So, my understanding is you're not going down bullets in terms of individual motions or anything to that effect. You're just trying to see as a board where we are consensus-wise, and then go back and address what I think Mr. Clanton was raising in terms of if we are to go back and do a reconsideration, what elements would we be looking at based upon the consensus that comes out of this discussion? Is that? Yes, is that, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. I just sort of want people, because I know, you know, and I appreciate Dr. Birdsong, you know, making sure that we are using the correct language in terms of the indicators. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want there to be this impression that you're going down some list that we were talking about trying to vote on, uh, four different things that you that you emailed no i think that that um the uh that would need to be worked out just want to see where we are on this um because there we might not need you know if no one's in agreement there's no consensus then yeah you know, i can't okay. determine how we're, how we're going to move forward until i have that information thank you yeah um miss basine yeah, um, Dr. Birdsong um, provided one of the corrections uh, that I was going to make to make sure that the core indicators were based on uh, the CDC indicators for dynamic decision making. Um, and the other piece is just to clarify and make sure, you know, the full board understands that previously we had said that, um, you know, the primary, the core and the secondary indicators will be used. And this is that we would still support, I mean, we would still, you know, of course, monitor the secondary indicators, but not hold tight to the secondary indicators as being the, um, you know, primary measures in which we would make, uh, you know, return to school or a closing based on. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then um, the next point would be revising, um, let's see. So right now, the motion as, it's, as it was passed um, is accepting the low, lowest to lower levels, the green levels of um, indicator levels, core indicator, well, core, both core and we already, we already, we, I don't want to get confused. So uh, we already talked about just Nor Norfolk, right? I had them. Okay. So just so I'm clear, I'm looking back at my, what I'd written here. I think I left it out. So that we we would look go from accepting the um, lower to lowest, which are the green indicator levels for the region, and um, propose to move to the moderate level for Norfolk in in context of the regional indicator levels. Did I say that right? I don't know. Oh. I mean, we've had this. Uh, okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, so let's 
So everyone is clear about the first point that you had made, Dr. Martin. The original mm -hmm. motion stated that with regards to indicators, the CDC indicators for dynamic decision making, we were going to adopt, we, we adopted the um, core indicators and the secondary indicators. Your suggestion after the discussion that um, we have had since our last meeting, which is, which is good, um, is um, a consensus on still monitoring the, the secondary indicators, but using the core indicators as Dr. Birdsong shared in the language that she suggested as our um, primary uh, metrics for returning to in-person instruction um, or bringing students out of in-person instruction. That's, that is the difference that we are at as far as that first point that you have brought up for the board to receive our uh, input on. Yes, but also the, um, that we are using the primary indicators within Norfolk. Fine. Previously, we had the regional ones, and now we're, we're, we're focusing on Drilling down to Norfolk. Yes. Okay. Dr. Bird's on your Yeah, I don't think you, I, I thought the agreement was with the, with local metrics the first time and not regional metrics. Right, it was. Yeah. Not what I'm, saying, I'm saying local in Norfolk, so local. Stays, yes. it's going to stay local. Yes, it will it's remain stay local, local, not change to regional. Right. Stay local. Right. Okay. We're clear on that first point then. Okay. And then um, the second movement, um, the second thing I want to get consensus around is moving from the green lowest and lower to allowing um, the, to phase, start, begin the phase in with the moderate level. Any comments? We good? Okay. And no, then- No, no, Dr. Martin, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. What you are proposing and what I heard um, from uh, Ms. Ms. Bassine and I, we've had a conversation about this and you and I have spoken about this. Um, I've spoken to a couple of board members about this. Um, the, going from the green uh, risk of transmission to the moderate risk of transition, I have angst about that um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, what we are saying then is that we would be allowing for in-person instruction via, um, I guess it would be the proposed hybrid model that the administration has put forth because that's the only way that we can effectively put forth the mitigation strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be returning students and staff at the yellow, um, which would be the moderate risk of transmission zone. Um, I have angst about that. I have angst about that for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is the um, overwhelming workload that I believe that it puts on our staff, specifically our classroom teachers. I think that it's very admirable that Dr. Birdsong and staff are trying to create a plan with both in-person and virtual learning simultaneously, but in practice, I don't know how effective that is going to be to deliver consistent education. So that's the first point. The second point is probably the most important, and that is an abundance of concern for the safety and well being of our staff members, many of whom are very seasoned veteran employees. And what I'm saying is they're in that category of risk. Um, our families in Norfolk live in multi-generational households. I'm not going to repeat what Dr. Lindsay said about Norfolk's demographics. I understand the data. I live and breathe it every day in my profession. I know that schools right now are not um, necessarily the points of outbreak. Um, it's coming from the community into the schools. And I understand that schools are actually um, they're looking at schools as being pretty safe, what the data has shown us. However, um, I think that we still take risk. And the risk that we are taking could be the potential loss of life. We are still taking risk if we embark on this transition of the yellow zone. So I'm sharing my thoughts, um, both as a board member, as a clinician who sees the families, treats the families, 
and cares for the families. These are the people behind the numbers. So I'm sharing this input with you with my angst about us transitioning into the yellow zone. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Ms. Basim. Ms. Basim? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, and so, and to be clear, I believe uh, the moderate zone would be to begin phase one. So this is not a full return. This is according to the phases that we have previously adopted. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is you know, on the same page about that, like who, who we're talking about at that level of risk. Um, and so um, I just wanna be clear about that. Um, the other piece, um, you know, the workload, you know, I, I totally, I, I, I hear you. I, I've been getting emails. I know everybody else has about the tremendous workload that would ensue once we return back to school. But that would happen if we are still green, yellow, whatever, you know, for the rest of this year, we're going to have a group of students who are learning virtually and a group of students who are learning in person. And that workload is going to be tremendous uh, regardless. Um, and, and I do think that's something we should look at, but that's, a, that's an aside. Um, as far as loss of life, you know, I, back in July, I know I, I use similar language too, that what will we do if we lost a student uh, to this virus? We've learned so much in the last several months about this virus, its impact, uh, its transmission. Uh, I too uh, read the research every day and and based on what we know today, I mean, we've lost children in the last eight months to gun violence, to suicide. We are losing children already, and we're going to lose more children. And so that's what weighs on me very heavily um, um, as, we, as we consider this planning. There are children that rely on our schools for nutrition. There are children that, that school is a safe place where they are identified for child abuse, where they are identified for mental health concerns. School is the safe place for so many of our children. And that's what I, I, I too think about. So I do support um, reconsidering the, the risk level for returning our students. But I just wanna be clear that we're not talking about bringing in all of the students all at the same time in that hybrid mode. We're talking about that phase one and doing it very carefully with the mitigation strategies in place. So but Ms. Bassine, we need to be clear to the public so that they understand that if we vote to be in the moderate zone, we are talking about proceeding with the phase in process. So it starts with phase one, but it then goes to phase two, three, four, and five. So in effect, we will be having all of the groups. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, yes, everybody could be theoretically in the building with our hybrid model under the yellow zone. If we get to that point, let's say we're complete, we, you know, we, whatever the weeks are that we end up having consensus on, that would be the amount of uh, students um, that would be phased in under that moderate zone. With the exception of those who choose to stay virtually. Well, that's, yes. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a given. Right. Um, Ms. Campson, go ahead. And then Mr. Clinton. Oh, thank you very much. I want to address something Ms. Basine brought up as we look at this, because I thought we were going to do this a little bit down the road, but I think it needs to be addressed now. Uh, as everyone's aware, I have been um, concerned about um, our uh, special on, on students with disabilities that are um, in self-contained classrooms, um, and they are our phase one. However, what I had proposed back when we voted for the, the phases uh, and put it on hold um, and been, and, you know, as you know, anxious to get it back. But I, I think adding it to this whole discussion was a, a good plan too. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm not complaining about that. But as, as a lifelong educator, um, and as we know nationwide, identifying as the most highly academically vulnerable groups during a virtual learning environment are our students with special needs who are self-contained. And there's a reason um, uh, for, for them being self-contained because they have IEPs um, 
and IEPs that put them in a self-contained situation uh, for a reason because they need a lot of support. And basically, the way they go through uh, with their uh, self-contained situation is they are really separated from a lot of, not physically separated, they're in the school buildings with everyone, but they are separated in how they are viewed and the, and the levels of support that they get. And so they have a lot of different things. For example, they have their own buses um, to come to school. So they're not going to be crowded into any big buses. They, um, they are in small rooms already with 10 um, or less. Uh, with, so the numbers are already reduced for them more than we'll be reducing in hybrid numbers for, for the regular education students. Um, there are all kinds of special things that are in place for them. And, and, and one of the things that we're missing that it's not in place for them is any uh, direct instruction person to person right now. And, and as we know nationally, that it, they are the most vulnerable groups for academics during this situation. And many of them are really not being able to respond to the type of learning that is in their IEP because it's not based on them being in front of a monitor. That's not the way that most of them the vast majority of them are learning. And so I had asked that, and, and, and this is what's done in, in the surrounding regions, part of region two in the state across the country, even when the schools are basically closed for in-person learning, this population is brought in to the buildings that actually have it. Probably, I don't know, maybe a fourth of our buildings don't have self-contained classrooms. They're certainly not in all buildings. And in the buildings they're in, except for perhaps Easton, uh, they are one, two, three, maybe four classes. And so what I wanted was us to, to step aside with those children as they have in Virginia Beach, even though they haven't reopened since they closed, um, have already have theirs back in, is to take that separate and look at it from that point of view that these are children with IEPs for all day learning and it is different than what the other children have in our mass and the mass population of what's happening in a schoolhouse. So were you to bring them back in rather than having hundreds of children coming in with them on, on buses that with even with all the planning are not six feet apart, it would be, I think, unnecessary for, the, for these children. And, I, and so that's why I was proposing and, and will contend that it, with these different items that you're adding, the reason that now rather than being a motion is going to be another item for people to consider is that they be considered separately from the metrics and things that are, other children are the way they are considered that for other things besides that, with all their academics. So that these children can be in the classroom in person for those whose parents are comfortable with it and consent to it, as we do for all of our children as we go through these re-entries, that we certainly will give our parents the option all year of remaining virtual. But I think that we're, we're missing, we're not meeting the needs of our most vulnerable children if we continue to leave them out. And I think if you, if you look at other districts and you were to ask them why, that's what they would be telling you also, is that we are not able to provide what their IEP is asking for in, this, in, in a virtual classroom situation. And so I'd like that considered as a point. They are the phase one children, but the phase one not have to meet all of these different points to have the option for the parents to have the option of letting their school, their children go back to school full time. Because it doesn't, all the Fear things, the crowd at the buses, the cafeteria, you don't need to open cafeterias for this small group of children. We give them grab and go meals every day anyway um, for those whose parents choose to do that. And so crowded hallways will never be there. Uh, if, if we start them early, the restrooms won't have anyone else in them when they go in. All the things that we worry about with bringing in hundreds and hundreds of children to a school each day will not exist with this very limited population. And so I ask for the other members of the board to think about that as we move toward doing another vote um, later this, this month. And that would go with the motion that I originally made for um, letting us step outside the metrics for this particular population.
Thanks, Ms. Kimson. Um, and with that, I think this is a good time to take a recess for our um, and go to our public hearing. And then we'll re reconvene um, at, was it 7.30? Or w whenever, whenever the... Um, Probably seven. Yeah, whenever the uh, budget hearing is over and we can continue this discussion. Well, excuse me, well, when we come back for that, will we come back to this address or will we, do we have a different? I thought I, there was something about a different one popping up, but I don't recall another one coming when I checked before this meeting. Uh, Dr. I mean, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tanner, I was, I was giving you a degree if you'd like it. I'll take it, but no, we'll stay at this one here. It'll be so when I come back, I, I mean, in other words, we're not leaving this meeting. We're just blanking ourselves out. Right. We're going to blank it out on YouTube and channel 47. All right. And so I'll just mute your, mute your screen. Right. And then I just leave it. I don't leave the meeting there. Right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being patient with me as I try to work my way through the technology. Yeah, Thank I, you. But I, um, Madam Chair, um, because we're going into a public hearing, which is different from the meeting, um, you're, I know you're saying you're recessing, but are you, are, you, are you amending your agenda to come back and continue this discussion? I think you need to pose that question before we reset. Is that what I need to do? Yeah. Okay. Um, then can I get a motion to amend the agenda so that we can come back to this meeting after the um, public hearing portion? Cool. No motion? Perhaps we could just start the discussion at our next meeting that leads into the vote. Well, no, we're not going to have the discussion and then vote on the same day. So that's why we're having the discussion today. So I move that we amend the agenda to have the discussion after the public hearing. I second the motion. Thank you. Ms. Tanner, please call the roll. Yes, Basine. Aye. Camson. Aye. Clanton. Okay. Nay. Gabriel? I said abstain, not nay. Oh, you said abstain. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I apologize. Abstain. Gabriel? Aye. Jordan? Aye. Smith? Aye. Martin? Aye. Okay. Okay, so again, Ms. Tanner, you want us to just mute ourselves and then go to the next link? No, you'll stay at this link. Are we staying in this going anywhere. Yeah, right. you just mute your, mute your video and your, your audio. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, um, let's go. I don't want to keep everyone waiting any longer. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I um, just want to welcome... Um, Okay, we see Mr. Clanton. I want to welcome everyone to the um, the first of two bud uh, public budget hearings that we'll be having for the 2021-22 um, school board budget. Um, so I want to welcome you all here. We do have some pump public comments that are posted to our website as, as we've been doing, um, but we are also going to hear from some community members on this Zoom uh, at this Zoom meeting as well. So, um, Dr. Birdsong, you have a presentation you're going to lead us off with. So, yes. please. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair Martin. Um, this evening, um, Mr. Jenkins, Steve Jenkins, our Chief Financial Officer, will be providing information to our public about the budget development process. Um, Mr. Jenkins will briefly review K 12 enrollment trends. Um, information about our general operating budget, um, priorities for fiscal year 2021's budget, as well as expenditure budgets, um, budget. expenditure budget by category. He's going to give um, the public some information about that and about our budget timeline. So without further ado, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you, Dr. Birdsong. Uh, good evening, Chairman, uh, Chairman and Martin. Vice Chairman Jordan, Dr. Birdsong, and members of the school board. Uh, as Dr. Birdsong had indicated, I'll provide a little text context behind your budget. Uh, starting with this slide, you can see the enrollment uh, trends over the last uh, a little over 10 years. 
Uh, the top line is the fall membership. That's the number of students that were in attendance uh, at the end of September. The line, the blue line that's right below it is the average uh, daily attendance for the entire year, or the average, I beg your pardon, average daily membership for the entire year. Uh, focusing on the average daily membership, you can see a uh, decline of uh, almost 4,300 students from thir over 31,000 in 2009 to uh, a, an original budget projection of 27,352 for this year. Of course, because of the coronavirus, membership for this year will be another 1,000 students lower, we believe, uh, than, the, than our original projection. Going to the next slide, we see a summary of the funding sources for the general fund. As you can see, practically all the funding is provided either by the state, uh, about 60% of our budget, or this, the city, which provides 36% of our general fund budget. A similar uh, trend has been in place for many years and is not expected to change significantly in the coming year. Slide four. This presents the uh, school board's priorities and strategies that guided the development of the fiscal 21 budget, or that's this year. Uh, priorities centered around staff compensation, as well as student safety, security, and academic progress, along with their social, physical, and emotional wellness. The physical conditions of school facilities was also a priority of the school board. Budget strategies included redeploying staffing, uh, to address priorities, aligning staff, uh, staffing with enrollment, using the federal CARES funds and local capital funds to maintain um, operations and services. Slide five. This contains a graph of the 2021 uh, general fund budget. We see that nearly three quarters of the budget is uh, directly related to instruction. Uh, we plan to spend 11% of the budget to operate and maintain facilities. The rest of the budget addresses student transportation, technology, administration, student uh, attendance, and health. The next slide. Uh, this portrays um, spending by major category. And as you can see, 85% of our budget is employee pay and benefits. That leaves just 14.6% of the budget to address everything else, including instructional materials, energy costs, and payments to contractors for facility repairs. Slide seven. This is a, staff, a graph of the staffing, and you can see it's very similar to the way we spend our funds, our, our dollars. In this case, 76% of our staff are directly related to teaching and learning. Uh, so that, but, and the rest of it is, as I said, very similar to our budget. The last slide I have for you tonight is a brief summary of the fiscal 22 timeline. And here you can see um, the uh, board is scheduled for a discussion on uh, budget priorities uh, this evening. Um, this will provide, uh, this will help provide direction to the administration and. Uh, I think you're scheduled to actually vote on those next month, excuse me, next at your next meeting. Uh, Governor Northern uh, is scheduled to release amendments on the biennial budget on December 18th. Um, we will update you on the educational impacts of the governor's budget on January 13th. Uh, Dr. Birdsong is scheduled to release the fiscal 22 budget on the 17th of February. That would be followed by a public hearing, which will be held to take citizen comments on the proposed budget in early March. In order to meet the city's budget deadlines, uh, we have scheduled your adoption of the budget on March 17th. We would then send the budget to the city manager for consideration by city council, um, and the council generally would take action of that, on that in May. Um, you may have to uh, also make adjustments based on council actions following um, their, their, their approval. Dr. Martin, that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you or the board may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins, I appreciate that. Um, 
So, Dr. Birdsong, do you have, or actually, are there any questions about the timeline? Okay, Ms. Smith, go ahead. No, my question isn't about the timeline. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So, Mr. Jenkins, Dr. Birdsong, uh, somewhere in this presentation, hopefully in January, we can get um, a report out, if you will, of what, what we have, what we accomplished with this budget in terms of uh, what was approved I'm probably not saying this properly, but bear with me. So there are some things that the CARES Act is paying for. My concern is that some of those things, while the CARES Act is paying for them, after the two-year window has passed, these, these um, requirements are still going to exist because they were originally in our FY 2021 budget and how are we going to address them in our 21-22 budget? Um, I wanna get some clarity on that as well as when we present the budget this year, we should include the CIP budget as well as the CARES Act, how we're going to move forward with that so that we can see the bigger picture of how we're utilizing our resources uh, versus only looking at the operating budget. There were things that we said we approved in the 2021 budget, and I'd just like to know how we're how well we're six months in more than six months in how well we're accomplishing those things for example there were uh new positions that we created did we fill those positions um there were some that we did away with just where are we because so much has happened during this fiscal year that doesn't normally occur and we had that opportunity to shift some of our um, some of our expenses or requirements to the CARES Act, and I and I think we just need to have a clear picture of how what took place, what has transpired. Oh, Dr. Martin, just in. Um, and I, I appreciate what uh, Ms. Smith has brought up. I think uh, what we should do tonight with the public hearing is to get an opportunity to hear from the public in terms of priorities. And then Dr. Ms. Smith, uh, as a board, as we go forward with the calendar, we'll get the opportunity to, uh, to do more delving into it uh, as, we, as we move forward. But because we have uh, members of the public who've been when been waiting, this just gives us an opportunity to, to hear from them tonight on what they think our priorities should be that can then help factor into our questions and conversations moving forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, all right, thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, all right. Well, let's go ahead with our first public speaker, Ms. Tanner. I'm going to take my mask off so I can speak clearly. Um, good evening for tonight's public hearing. Speakers have three minutes to provide public comments. A timer will alarm to signal the conclusion of your remarks. When I call your name, I will ask if you desire to have your video shown. If so, please reply yes or no. If yes, we will show your video and you can begin to speak. If you reply no, you may begin to share your public comments. If you join the public hearing via phone and not the Zoom webinar feature, then kindly press star six to unmute yourself and begin to speak. So Madam Chair, our first speaker for today is Philip Hawkins. And just allow one moment for us to have him show on the screen.
I'm sure you can also sure. You may begin, Mr. Hawkins. Good evening, school board chair, Dr. Martin, vice chair, Mr. Jordan, members of the Norfolk School Board, superintendent, Dr. Birdsong, and members of the MPS administrative team. Good evening, my name is Philip Hawkins Jr. and I'm a pre-K-4 early childhood elementary educator, teacher at the PB Young Senior Elementary School with 20 years, 23 years of experience with Norfolk Public Schools. I am also a member of the Norfolk Public Schools Educational Planning Steering Committee. Tonight I am speaking as an individual at this public hearing to express that um, I am concerned about some of the priorities. I have heard the discussions tonight on different aspects of the proposed budget. And it looks like we do have some focus on what we need to do as we move through this pandemic. However, um, I wanted to highlight some of the urgent priorities that I think the board should consider as well as the administration as we work through the budget planning process. Um, I am very encouraged that Norfolk looks like we have a new source of revenue that will possibly come back to the public schools with the Norfolk Resort and Casino. So I would love to see and hear what the school board plans to do in collaboration with the Norfolk City Council and the Team Norfolk City Manager team to ensure that the 30 million that is projected to come in tax revenue that the school system receives a, a good sizable portion of that tax revenue for our schools and specifically our capital improvements projects. Um, I've been on the educational planning steering committee for several years now, and it seems like we're at an impasse. We heard that we're going to get some updates on that, but the committee we had some virtual discussions earlier this year during the pandemic, but there was still much unfinished business. So we would love to see more engagement with the administration as well as, and I'm speaking as an individual, but if you talk to the other committee members who were serving in that capacity, they will also express that we have not really heard anything about the 10 year proposed master plan for our facilities. And so we definitely want to see more community engagement in that process, even throughout this pandemic. We have become creative in how we can still stay connected to our community. So that's very important. And in my last 10 seconds, I do want to identify that we need to make sure that staffing at the school level is protected at all costs. We need to make sure we continue to hire the best and the brightest and keep our schools funded and improve the school facilities. Thank you for your time, and I will send my comments after this, the highlights to you as a board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Um, Ms. Tanner, the next speaker. I just, I just want, want to share, share as, as a reminder, reminder the school board does, does not provide the public, public comments on tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Who's next, Rich? We're checking to make sure that individuals here. Bonnie. Okay, our next speaker is Bonnie McNabb. You ready? You can begin, Ms. McNabb. I'm sorry. I actually selected in this meeting that I didn't want to make a comment. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said you do not want to make a comment? No. Okay, that's fine, ma'am. We'll go to the next person. Sorry for that. No, that's okay. Just one moment. Vicki Kern. Vicki Kern. Okay, you may begin, Vicki. Uh, yes, good evening, Dr. Martin, Dr. Birdsong, and members of the school board. 
My name is Vicki Kern, and I'm representing the Norfolk Chapter of Virginia Organizing. It has been documented that school shooting casualties have not been stopped by SROs. There's little supportive interaction between students and SROs. The presence of SROs in the schools has negatively impacted the learning environment of students of color, unless so, <clears throat> excuse me, unless so, um, white students, and in many cases are in the schools just to make arrests. Evidence shows that the presence of SROs in our schools supports the school to prison pipeline, which we feel must be stopped. School resource officers are contracted through the Norfolk Police Department. We would like to see this contract ended and the SROs replaced by social workers and other qualified personnel who will keep students, schools, and communities safer. If SROs are removed from schools, members of Virginia Organizing will go to the city council to ask that this extra money remain in the Norfolk Public Schools budget for additional counselors and social workers, which will help offset any additional funding that would be needed for these additional counselors and social workers. The Norfolk chapter of Virginia Organizers or Organizing is very grateful that the school board is considering taking up this important issue of removing SROs from our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kern. And we will go to our next individual in just one second. All right, Megan McNamara, would you like to be on camera or would you like audio? Oh, I'm actually not speaking. I'm just listening. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to our next person on the list. Patrice Smallwood, would you like to be on video or you like audio instead? Audio is fine. Okay. You may begin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrice Smallwood and I serve on the ministerial staff at New Macedonia Christian United Church of Christ in Norfolk. My family owns property in the Bruce's Park community in Norfolk and I am also a member of the Norfolk chapter of Virginia organizing. So my love and my roots for Norfolk runs deep. I'm here because I also support the removal of school resource officers from uh, the schools for several reasons. First, SROs are armed police officers introduced into the schools initially to protect against mass shootings. However, research shows that increase in police presence has neither stopped nor prevented school shootings. Second, our schools have ample security presence to handle disciplinary issues. There are three to four school security officers already allocated to each middle and high school. These unarmed personnel are trained to handle the minor non-criminal offenses that occur in the schools. And so the schools can call the police department if they need additional assistance. Third, considering today's social and political climate, the mere presence of police in our schools has the potential to intensify emotions and create an uncomfortable learning environment for the students. Uh, moreover, the research shows that our black and brown students are arrested in disproportionate numbers, which ultimately contributes, as it's been said, to the school to prison pipeline. Fourth, in speaking with Norfolk public school teachers and staff, there seems to be no real consistency in the practices of SROs and no real consideration given to the selection and placement of SROs in our schools. Some SROs build positive relationships and interact with the students, teachers, and the staff. However, other SROs are non-relational and therefore serve no useful purpose in the schools. And finally, the most troubling aspect of the SRO program is the apparent lack of oversight, evaluation, and accountability of the SROs. Uh, the memorandum of understanding between the Norfolk Public School and the Norfolk Police Department is severely uh, outdated. It has been severely outdated, uh, and it lacks clarity on the basic guidelines. And so the SRO um, evaluations we have learned that have not been conducted yearly uh, as required. Uh, and so while we have advised uh, that this MOU is being updated, uh, we are concerned about the gap. And so considering all this, I impressed upon the school board to end its contract with the Norfolk Police Department to remove the SROs from 
the schools. And I believe that this funding can be used toward hiring additional social workers and psychologists who are better able to address the intricate needs of the students, the teachers and the staff, for it will be the social workers and the psychologists in our schools that will uh, be a priority as they uh, continue to deal uh, with this pandemic, whether it's through virtual learning or in-person learning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mowood. As we reset the timer, our next speaker is Sierra Lewis. And if you'd like to be on camera, let us know or on audio. We have Sierra Lewis. Reese. Hello, mommy. Mommy. Hello, mommy. Okay. Oh, hello. Is this Sierra Lewis? Yes, this is me. I can go. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to be on video or audio? Audio, please. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay. You may begin. Okay, my name is Sierra Lewis, and I'm with Virginia Organizing. We're here tonight in hopes you guys will reconsider implementing school resource officers throughout Norfolk schools. We ask that the school board uh, vote to remove armed police officers from all public schools immediately. Although I don't have any children of my own, I believe in the power of education and that children are entitled to attend a school where their health and safety is a priority. There is an assumption that SROs provide safety and security, but often they can be a threat to the very well-being of students, especially those who are Black, Indigenous, people of color. Their mere presence of officers fosters a school-to-prison pipeline environment that is not conducive to learning. In an era where we've seen school shootings become a common occurrence, SROs are not the solution. Research shows school shootings have not been stopped by them, Four securities usually occupy each school, so there would be no purpose for an additional police presence. If SROs are removed from the schools, Virginia Organizing will go to city council and ask that this extra money be allocated toward to North Public Schools for additional counselors and social workers. We must diligently, I'm sorry, we must work diligently to invest in our children's safety, education, and future. We must do so in a way which is equitable and on the right side of history. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lewis. We're gonna reset the clock. And as we do that, we want to get Ms. Sarah Miller to be prepared. Is Sarah Miller here tonight? Yes, I'm present, thank you. Okay, would you like to be on video or audio? Um, either is fine, video is fine. Okay, we're gonna set you up in video. Just one moment and I'll let you know when to begin. Okay, you may begin. Um, thank you and good evening, Dr. Martin, Dr. Birdsong and school board members. To paraphrase board member um, Linnell Gibson, who said students have the right not to speak to the Norfolk police officers, which SORs are, am I correct? Are students informed of such rights? And if no legal requirement, what was the deciding factor to have SOROs in the Norfolk schools? I also am inquiring if you are listening to the voices and experiences of our students. This is such an important matter because our students are the future of our communities. And Ms. Tanya Basson has already raised a point in a question that I also want addressed. What is the demographic of students surveyed? Someone on the board stated that SROs have been in the school system since the 1990s, and yet there is no annual data available on their effectiveness or the direct student impact. So I'm questioning the commitment of the annual tracking considering the past history. Now, Principal Smedley has claimed that SROs have a non-threatening presence, but that is her claim and not necessarily the experience of our students. The fact that SROs have negatively impacted some students more than others needs acknowledgement. Black students have a different experience than their non-Black peers, which has been displayed by research. It's easy to make policy, but please consider how these policies impact those most directly dealing 
with their implementation. As Officer Sheldon remarked, kids are worth the time. And as a member of Virginia Organizing Norfolk Chapter, I'm a voice for the best interests of our Norfolk students. In considering and reconsidering SROs in the Norfolk schools, please also consider those funds can be budgeted for counselors and social workers. Thank you for listening to my concerns. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And our next speaker is Leland Brady. Leland Brady. Okay, sorry about that. Um, if I could just be on audio, please. That's fine. Okay, you thank you so end. much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leland Brady. I am currently the advocacy co-chair for the Urban League of Hampton Roads Young Professionals. I am also the first vice president and advocacy chair for the League of Women Voters of South Hampton Roads. Um, I wanted to express my um, support for Virginia Organizing's commitment to removing SROs from the schools. Um, like everybody said, um, we would like to edit, um, I'm sorry, allocate those monies that would have been going to the SROs towards additional counselors and social workers that would be more beneficial for the mental health and safety of students of color, mostly Black, um, Indigenous students of color. So, um, yeah, I guess, sorry about that. Yes, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Uh, Leland Brady. And up next, as we bring this individual forward, Emily Goodman Scott. Hi there, greetings. Um, I'm happy to be on video if that works with our technology tonight. Okay, give us give us just one moment. We'll have of you on. Of course. Here. All right, let's see. Okay. All right, greetings. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Norfolk uh, School Board and staff that are here, thank you. My name is Dr. Emily Goodman Scott. I'm here first and foremost as a parent. I have uh, my oldest child is in Norfolk Public Schools. I have two more coming right up behind her. My oldest is in first grade. I'm also a faculty member and associate professor at ODU. I'm in the College of Education and my specialty areas in school counseling and mental health counseling as well. Um, before my time at ODU, I was a school counselor as well as a special education teacher and I've been in education um, about 15 years or so. So thank you, thank you for your service and your commitment to um, our children and our schools. So I'm here as many others before me to talk about student resource officers in the, in the schools. And um, first and foremost, in my experience, I grew up in the Hampton Roads area and I've been here for, for quite a while. And some things I've been particularly impressed with in Norfolk Public Schools is the emphasis on prevention and getting ahead of problems and um, providing that support for students, such as um, the focus on PBIS in schools, which has been renewed in recent years. So thank you recently, more recent time on um, that renewal. I've also been very impressed and I've done some work with your school counselors. And um, I've been impressed that the school counselors have been leading the way in their efforts and their use of time, such as getting rid of those 504 responsibilities that um, they typically do. So that, that's really been um, very innovative and aligned with best practices. So those things right there tell me and really reiterate the emphasis that Norfolk Public Schools has on um, prevention and focusing on the whole child. So in line with that, as we talk about SROs tonight, as you've heard from the people um, before me, we know that um, the SROs, there's been a lot of research that have described the challenges with SROs. Um, having police in schools, that increases the, the criminalizing nature of our schools or increases it, but rather adds, it adds a criminalizing nature to our schools, as well as this policing or militarization. And um, there are a number of negative um, impacts for schools and students that, as others have said, has really been exacerbated for students of color, which is the majority of our, our students here and families at NPS. So one study in particular, as a researcher, um, I got to throw a study in there, and I know you all are aware of this. Um, to throw this in as well, Cha and Gottfriedson conducted a nationally representative study 
looking at a very large sample. And um, they examined if you increase police in schools, um, what will happen with um, student crimes? So the thought is if you increase police, you're gonna see a decrease in student crime. As we've mentioned, we've thrown in things about student shootings tonight and other things. Um, but what researchers found out, researchers found out the opposite. When you increase police in schools, you're actually, they found that you're also increasing the crime um, and the crime reported at schools. And their thought was, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we focus on crime and we're having a greater emphasis on criminalizing our schools, that's the response we're gonna get. Well, if we look for something, we're gonna find it. On the other hand, if we focus and continue to focus on prevention and teaching for social behaviors, um, again, that emphasis on school counseling, PBS, et cetera, we're gonna have those, those outcomes for students. So um, thank you for your time. I think that was my timer. So I'm gonna um, jump off, but thank you so much. And if I can be of any further um, assistance or conversation, this is um, areas of my research, so happy to talk more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Goodman Scott, Dr. Goodman, Goodman Scott. Our next speaker is Glennis Mason. Ms. Mason, would you like to be on video or audio this evening? I, I do not have a comment to make tonight. I submitted a letter for you to review. Okay, and the school board has received those public comments that you yes. submitted. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Our next speaker, as we reset it, would be, I believe, Baird Hicks. Is that the same thing? Not yet. Okay, He's Mr. Not Hicks is not here. Next Just one moment. James Washington. Okay, the next speaker we have is James Washington. Mr. Washington, would you like to be on video or audio tonight? Oh, uh, video. Okay, give us just one moment. Okay, we're ready for you to begin, sir. Hi, how y'all doing tonight? Uh, I'm a member of Virginia Organizing. Uh, I'm James Washington. I live in the Park Place community. Uh, I'm here to ask you School resource officers uh, to remove be moved out removed out of school and instead of use money to get more social workers counselors, this will have a great impact on people in in my community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Washington. We're going to move on to our next speaker. Okay, our next speaker is Natalie, and um, forgive me if I do not pronounce your last name per, um, correctly, is Edermansening? It's Edermanasinga. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Not a problem. It happens all the time. <laughs> okay. Did you want to be on video or audio this evening? Um, audio is fine. Okay, you can begin. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you um, for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. My name is uh, Natalie Edermanasinga. I am also a faculty member at ODU, an assistant professor in the Counseling and Human Services Department in the College of Education, and a proud former school counselor in middle school. And uh, I would like to speak in support of the Norfolk chapter of Virginia Organizing and their request that the school board vote to remove armed police officers from all public schools as soon as possible. As you all know, and as you all have spoke about uh, just during this meeting, there, we are facing a mental health crisis uh, in, our, in our schools. Suicide rates of children between the ages of 10 and 17 are rising. And what we know about mental health is that many issues start appearing during childhood and adolescence. So we have this opportunity to foster healthy and mentally stable children who are able to handle their mental health challenges in a way that keeps them and those around them safe as they grow and to take care of us someday. We need to treat these behaviors in our schools with remediation and support, teaching our students how to handle their emotions and stressors in a safe and healthy way. 
However, having armed police officers in schools sends a message to our children that their behaviors are criminal. And unfortunately, there is very little evidence that police in schools actually reduce discipline or keep our schools safe. However, when we look at our national studies on schools who invest in mental health services, we find that these schools see improved attendance, academic achievement, and higher graduation rates. We also see that lower rates, we also see lower rates of discipline incidences, expulsions, and suspensions. And when we think about how our educators are trained, our school counselors, and I can speak as someone who trains our school counselors in the Norfolk area, are specifically trained on childhood and adolescent development, how to handle crisis, crisis situations in schools. And um, they are being trained in our schools to, they have to graduate with uh, internship hours in our schools. However, SROs are not necessarily trained that way. I encourage you to vote to remove armed police officers from our school buildings so that we can use that funding to have more school counselors in our schools. We cannot criminalize our children and we truly need our students to feel mentally, emotionally, and physically safe when they walk in the school building. Mental health support has proven to provide the safety and unfortunately more police officers in schools have not. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Mary Anna White. Would you like to be on video or audio this evening? Um, video would be fine, thank you. Okay, give us one moment to transition. Okay, I see you, you may begin. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Mariana White, a teacher at Granby High School and a member of the EAN and a community activist. Um, I would like to talk about uh, returning to school in person. I realize this is a budget hearing, but this is um, a matter that you're discussing. And I just feel that safety should always come first um, for every child. Um, the first phase kids are um, special ed students and English um, language learners, and their safety is critical. Their families' safety and the staff members who would um, work with them. Of course, we do not want any student to get behind in developing their potential, but we cannot endanger their health or the health of their family members or the staff members. Um, so I would ask that we um, continue the strictest measures of keeping everybody safe and not send anyone back to school um, when there is moderate risk or any risk. Thank you so much for letting me um, speak about this issue. Take care. Thank you. And our next speaker is Sharice Newsom. Would you like to be on video or audio this evening? Video, please. Okay, just one moment. Okay, you may begin. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Birdsong, and team. I'm Sharice Newsom, president of the Norfolk Council of PTAs, and it is so good to see your faces. I hope that everybody is staying safe and doing well. I want to thank you for answering all those emails, all those phone calls, and for spending so many long hours thinking through your decisions about what's going to be best for Norfolk Public Schools. I implore you to continue working collaboratively with a spirit of togetherness. We are in this together. With regard to the budget, I'd like to remind you that the Norfolk PTA passed two position statements this summer, and I'm here tonight to ask you to provide funding according to those positions. The first position statement of the Norfolk PTA is on advancing equity and diversity. We ask that you invest money into building a more equitable school system and provide resources where there are gaps, paying close attention to instructional, social, and emotional learning needs of students of color students with special needs, and students from communities facing economic stress. 
Additionally, the equity and diversity position statement supports the renaming of schools with Confederate ties and other culturally insensitive depictions. The Norfolk PTA advocates for funding to address the renaming of these schools. The second position statement is on Virginia's school reopening plan. The Norfolk PTA asks that you allocate funding that prioritizes the health and welfare of students, teachers, and staff, that supports in-person and virtual options for a long-term basis, that provides financial support for more family and community engagement, which is so important, including developing community partnerships to support your outreach efforts. Please use your budget to fund personal protective equipment for students, teachers, and staff when there is a return to in-person instruction. Please provide money for ongoing technology needs as well as hardware repairs, which will be, continue to be a need for students and for staff. Additionally, please pay for staff and give our teachers the raises they deserve. Also, consider funding for policies that will provide additional instructional support for students who may be inequitably impacted this year because of the extended school closure as well as the virtual learning conditions. We, please, we ask that you fund these items with ongoing sustainable funds, not just one-time funds for which there is no guarantee. As always, I thank you for everything that you do for students. As the Norfolk Council of PTS PTA say all the time, we are in this together. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next speaker as we transition is Rahib, Rabib Hassan. And please forgive me if I mispronounced your name. I said, did you want to be on video or audio this evening? I'm going to ask you to unmute if you can. Mr. Hassan, is there a way you can unmute your, you would press star six if you're on the phone line. Okay. Okay. So you do not want to give public remarks. The next person is Heidi Johnson. Would you like to be on video or audio tonight, Ms. Johnson? And we just need you to unmute you. Okay. You do not care to give comments tonight. So the next person, okay. According to our spreadsheet, when we people registered, that was the last individual that had public comments for tonight's public hearing, except for, oh, I apologize, you have one more person? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have April Harmon. April Harmon. Do you have a rich? Okay, April Harmon, you're going to be on video this evening. How are you? We just need you to unmute your line. We just Good evening, everyone. No, I um, thank you for the opportunity, but no, I did not have any comments for this evening. Okay. Thank you very much. I apologize for that. That's okay. All right. Um, Madam Chair, that was the last speaker that we had um, for this evening, Ms. Newsom. So that concludes our public speakers for tonight. What happened? Okay, I, I don't know if uh, if, if uh, Dr. Martin dropped. Nope. I, I think that is the last item on the agenda at this time. Is that correct? 
Anything, uh, oh, there's Dr. Martin. Uh, anything additional from, uh, from the administration, Dr. Birdsong? Okay, hearing none, uh, Dr. Martin is back. I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you. Um, for some reason, I kept going as the speakers were changing, as they were transitioning, it would transition my video oh, on and off. So just for future note, um, even though I was, I was seemed to be watching as a spectator, so I was still on, but just not able to participate. Okay, so um, so the uh, public hearing meeting is portion is adjourned. So I'd like to go back to our to continue our um, previous discussion at our work session. So, Hold on. Um, Dr. Martin. Yes. Oh, there, I was going to say I, I didn't see Dr. Birdsong, but I see her. I see her there. All I right. think it just popped back in. All right. Um, Magic. Like disappear <laughs> I, know. I know this technology is not perfect, but at least we have it, right? Um, Ms. Tanner, can you please proceed uh, with calling the roll as we begin our, uh, or as we continue our um, work session discussion under item 7.01, review of return to school and in-person transition plan? Yes. Uh, Ms. Dean? Here. Hampson. Here. Clanton. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, for the record, can you show that, um, have the record reflect that I was in attendance of the first portion at, um, at 4.01 p.m. present? Yes. Okay, Gabriel. Present. Jordan. Here. Smith. Here. Martin. Here. Um, Ms. Birdsong, Dr. Birdsong, I'm trying to find you. Dr. Birdsong, do you have everyone in attendance um, as far as administration that needs to be here? Um, I believe so. Dr. Pohl, are you here? I'm here. Okay, great. Oh, I see you're right beside me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not on my screen. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to have it so you can pin everyone together. That'd be great. Okay, so we had left our conversation off with um, Dr. Uh, with Ms. Campson talking about um, the uh, having the self um, phasing in the self contained uh, special education students independent of the other students. Is that accurate, Ms. Campson? Yes, thank you. And can you remind me? Um, did you also, just so we're clear, um, did you also say that you wanted them to be considered independent of the health um, condition matrix, the CDC matrix? Yes. Okay. Just so we're clear on that. Okay, so um, the other item that I wanted to try to get a consensus on was um, reducing the interim transition time frame and the original motion from three weeks to two weeks. Is there anyone who um, is not in agreement to including that. Mr. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not in agreement. Um, I, I believe that we have, just looking at the timing around it, two weeks is the time frame that we're using um, based on the CDC, um, what they have, you know, the measurements, 14 days. Um, I think that we still need that additional time to notify parents in the community that once we've looked at that time frame, and it says as a green light that we have enough time to adequately, adequately um, notify them so that they can begin to make preparations. And I think that that's the original spirit of why we went with the three weeks. So I, I just think that taking that additional week off of that um, does begin to may potentially create a, um, an undue hardship um, to parents when we're trying to talk about changing things that we may not want to intend to do. So that's my feeling on that. So the transition phases, just for clarification, um, would be also again while monitor monitoring the um, the health matrix conditions. So, um, Dr. Birdsong, um, can you speak to what type what what would be a sufficient time frame um, as the transition times is 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 it three weeks or is two weeks too soon for for you to um, make those plans as we transition forward? Well, optimally, you know, as I presented to you um, 
back in October, we requested um, a three week transition for operational purposes and, and the board did agree to that. So optimally three weeks would, would be um, better than two weeks. Um, and, and so if, if I had to make the recommendation, I would stick with the three weeks. Okay. Any comments on that from the school board? Okay. So I think out of respect for Dr. Birdsong, we'll keep, we should keep that at two weeks. Does anyone Does Dr. That? Birdsong respect to my comment? <laughs> What you mean? I'm saying yes. I'm I know. I'm just picking which is late. Go ahead. But obviously, you would be implementing it, and I, I think we said the same thing. Three, I, I, three I weeks. Think Mr. Clinton oh, yeah. was advocating for three weeks, which is yeah. what I was advocating for. So I think we right. said the same thing. <laughs> okay. But I will acknowledge, Mr. Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So. So that one's. Okay, um, so going back to um, the uh, core indicator levels and the talking about moving them from the greens and accepting the um, moderate and under, so the, the yellow moderate and the two greens lower and lowest levels. Um, besides Dr. Birdsong, is in, there anyone else who um, would like to opposes moving to the orange level. Mr. Clanton and anyone else? Okay. Um, Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, hold on. Um, Are we voting? Dr. Martin? No, we're not voting. I'm trying to get a consensus, but do you, if you have a comment, I, you can go ahead and speak. But I, I just thought you were raising your hands. Go ahead, um, Dr. Gabriel. Did you, did you mean to say me instead of Dr. Birdsong? That's what I, I thought. That's what you. Oh, meant. I'm sorry. I said. I thought I said doctor. Am I? Yeah. Am I said doctor <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's okay. I just wanted to make sure we we're good. Yes. Yes, doctor. Well, I wrote down doctor Gabriel. Okay. Yep. Um, and then, uh, yes, Mr. Clinton, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I, for first and foremost, um, I like to to commend uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Basine, for. Um, taking the advice at the last meeting and reaching out to each other. I very much appreciate that. Um, and having the conversation um, regarding uh, and what she was presenting to me. Um, I am not, I'm not in a position right now today uh, uh, to move. Um, just looking at everything else that's going on around us. And I know that it's been said to me that this isn't what we're saying right here today. This is why I feel like it's important to take up the action. Um, and I will probably talk about it at some point, but what Ms. Campson was presenting because I don't still don't think that we have a, a date for which we're kind of benchmarking off when we'll actually determine when we start counting down these two weeks. But right now, as we're looking, everybody's in the, in the red pretty much. And, um, and even though we do see the, um, the positive horizon of some type of vaccination, um, I am not in a uh, using, moving that for everybody. Uh, I do, however, um, do support um, the consideration of Ms. Campson about some of our most vulnerable students, uh, potentially looking at those with self, um, self isolated, some of the self isolated students there, um, and looking at those particular things only if it's safe there. I do know that the administration has been working very hard. They made the presentations to us regarding what measures we put in place um, for our students. But right now, um, all the signs are showing us, you know, I think Isla White was in, in the next school division the day that just reversed. Um, I do think that we need to take those things in consideration and not look at it in isolation. I know that we're not looking at regional and we're looking more local, but I think local also says it's 757 because we cannot talk about what's happening in Norfolk because all of our teachers don't live in Norfolk. All of our staff members don't live in Norfolk. And they're, um, and this isn't like the NBA bubble, which worked really well because it was a controlled environment. We have many different variables that are being introduced each and every day when we open schools up that are coming back into our schools. And though the studies do show that schools aren't a main area of, of transmission. It's what happens inside, outside of those school buildings that really concern me and the potential for having some much more devastating um, situations. So I like to stay more on the air of keeping us within the green, um, uh, and within the two greens or keeping the 5% or below. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clinton. Um, 
And so I wanted to go to something you said. It, um, okay, actually, I'm going to switch. Uh, Ms. Bassine, can you talk more about the, um, uh, in response to Mr. Clinton's comment about the conditions, can you talk more about the phase and conditions? Because, you know, why we're not putting, we haven't discussed, we're trying to stay away from putting a date on it and um, and looking at, yeah, um, well, I, I certainly understand uh, the rationale behind putting a a date, you know, a projected date. But that's that's all that it honestly would be would be a projected date, um, because at the end of the day, the health conditions would drive the de the decision to to you know press go on on starting to pull kids back in. It, it's not so much, you know, whether it's January 4th or January 11th. And here we are, it is that we are in the risk level that, you know, in the condition that we agree uh, to bring students back in. And so, I mean, we can certainly think about putting a date, but first and foremost is the, is coming to some agreement around the conditions. And that's where I think the focus needs to be on that piece um, first. So, Madam Chair, if I may respond to that, mm -hmm. um, I just for the for, for the purposes of the community listening to this, um, there has agreement been made. October twenty first, this board voted on conditions, so there is a motion in effect for how we're going to operate. Um, again, this is why I stress back: these are con reconsiderations that right. we're making. We have made a decision; um, we voted on it, and that's what we communicated. We're now talking about uh, going back um, and making some reconsiderations and some modifications to that. Now, speaking to the date, the only reason why I think the date, because that was really, I think one of the first motions I made when we had this discussion, wasn't that we were gonna open on that day, but we just needed a ground zero to say that this is where we're gonna start measuring our two weeks, three weeks. So from February 4th, three weeks leading up, or two weeks leading up to that uh, day is what we're gonna measure. And if we're not there, then guess what? We're doing two weeks out from that date and two weeks out from that date until we get to a, a base marker. So it's, so in other words, I look at a date as a base marker, an opportunity to say, this is the point that we're gonna measure so the administration has a clear direction from the two weeks out before or two weeks after and concurrent until we reach the necessary green zone um, that we agreed on in October 21st. Okay, um, two things. One, um, we've learned more about this virus. We are learning more about it every day. So we've learned more since uh, our October 21st meeting, which is why the plan has always been to continue to, to learn more, to pay attention, to watch the matrices, how they're impacting our, our district and our, our city, local locality and our region. Um, and so it's, I don't think it's um, too far you know, too crazy that we would continue to have this discussion, um, even though we did vote on based on the knowledge that we had October 21st. Um, and also, um, Dr. Birdsong has asked from us repeatedly to look at the risk levels and, and determine uh, based on risk levels. And this was also a recommendation made by um, Dr. Lindsay when she came and spoke with us. So we are trying to follow in line with the best practices and so that is why we're not looking at a date. I mean, it, it seems, um, I mean, there's a lot of scenarios that could happen that can make the, the date irrelevant. Um, so that's why we're, we, we, that's why we initially in October based it on, on matrix and we'd like to continue to do that. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Um, Martin, I, I think that um, we're saying same, some of the same things, but then we're not. Mm -hmm. um, we're, this is an ongoing conversation, just like this pandemic is ongoing. Um, but I, 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 I'd really stress the point that you're right. We have learned a whole lot since October 21st. And what we're learning right now is that there are variables outside of what I said before in the community, which um, are showing a high rise of infection rate and which is now putting us up in a red level. When we start talking about the holiday season and so forth, it may be a totally different ball game when we get into January. But mm -hmm. I think right now having a date, even if we said, and, you know, in February, you know, the third quarter, whatever else is what we're going to benchmark it off. I don't really see the numbers changing and drastically going down before um, we get to that uh, that particular point in time so that it would be any other change. But I just don't want us to continue to send the community on a necessary kind of like roller coaster. 
I think if we get some clear direction and we kind of stay the course there and give some, uh, some concrete direction of where we're gonna go when we keep that measurement and rather than being kind of moving um, so much, I think that that's a better way of approaching. That might be my, that, that's my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, and, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but, uh, or, or what you're doing is wrong at this particular point. But I just think that we, if we made a decision, that's what we're sending to the community, then we need to stand on that unless there is something major, like we have vaccines that are coming in. Um, and that may change a whole lot of different things going forward. But I think I've also brought it up in policy conversation about, you know, vaccination. You know, is that going to be a requirement? Is that something going to come to Virginia Assembly? There's a whole lot of different other things measured in there. But I'm still not ready to move and change that from the green. And, and that's just where I'm at. So I appreciate and I respect all of your comments there, just like I asked for my, my colleagues to respect mine. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we're having this discussion because we want to make sure that everyone has a voice, their opinions heard and respected. Um, I will say I have been, you know, like many of you are also monitoring these metrics. We are still in the red, but we are trending down. Um, and so that, again, is why it's um, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve, um, try to try to really get ahead of this so that as we start trending in the orange or lower levels that Dr. Birdsong can gear up to get ready to um, to to start the phase in, and so you know instead of missing the mark where say it trends down, we have to get together for a meeting, you know, it, before the date. I mean, it's just um, and then it trends up by the date. I mean, that that's another roller coaster ride that I don't want to take our community on. Um, I know we have a couple hands, Miss um, uh, Campson and then Miss Basine, and then Miss Smith. Thank you. First of all, I didn't actually understand what Mr. Clanton was saying about start dates until he just explained it a second time for me. I like the idea and, and of what he's saying because he's saying, all right, so if we say tomorrow on December 24th or whatever the tomorrow is, uh, we will start monitoring. Tell me if I'm wrong or right on this one, uh, Mr. Clanton, but we will start monitoring the two weeks you know, to see if we hit the two week mark and then it would be a go. And and Dr. Birdsong would then <coughs> know she wouldn't have to pull us in. She would know if she was following it. Is that is that what you were saying? Because that makes sense. Because why thinking. not start the clock now? Today, let's start and let's start monitoring for the two weeks where we have either steady or down over those two weeks. Is that what you meant? That makes sense to me. That's what that's what people seem to be doing. They're looking for those two weeks of 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 no change or a downward change, right? And, and just to it's be not clear, just we, about we are monitoring. Oh, we yeah, we yeah. are monitoring uh, Miss Campson, as you know, daily because when no. the board decided uh, to utilize the lower and lowest uh, risk of transmission levels. Um, Certainly, we started monitoring right away, but I did want to share, you know, I think I heard someone say that we were trending down. We're actually, our, um, our, we have an increasing trend. We That's actually have high burden, increasing trend, and we're at substantial community transmission, so we're not trending down. I was looking at the numbers from the past few days, and they're, they're decreasing according to the, um, the first core indicator per 100,000, I'm just saying, so that's all, okay. I, so, sorry. Is that, go ahead, Dr. Gabriel, do you have something to say? Oh, no, 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 I'm, you can call, get to me last, because there were many other people ahead of me. Okay, um, I see, Ms. Um, Basine, go ahead. You know, that's okay, I defer to my colleagues that can come back later. The next one on my list is Ms. Smith. Thank you. I do support um, reconsidering using the primary or core indicators being in the green. Um, I also support uh, the interim transition, keep, uh, keeping that as it originally was. Um, my understanding, the transition was from the first return to in-person to the fading in of the other groups um, that we had determined and not 
three weeks from a set date. As Dr. Bergson explained, my understanding the monitoring had started once we agree on um, the previous motion on the 21st of October. So I would just like to um, suggest to my colleagues that, you know, we're not in a perfect world. And if we could find some places in this um, recommendation for reconsideration to compromise, then let's try to do that and come up with something that we all can live with. That's it. Okay, so you're saying that you you would like to stay with the, the original motion of the green and lower, the, the two greens. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, I'm, just, I'm repeating it just for clarification. I support um, having the core indicators in the green and the secondary indicators can be in the yellow. What's recommended? No, hold on a second. Time out. Time out. Well, that, no, no, just a second. Um, no, this what we're what's what is on the table. What we were talking about is um, to have the primary core indicators to, and um, in context with as our decision making indicators in context with the secondary indicators. Whereas the current what we what we previously passed was that. All, both primary and secondary indicators would have to be in the greens. Right, but hold on, Ms. Smith. On the chart, on the chart that we have here, these are the the core indicators. The core indicators that we agreed on in October was to keep those core indicators in the green zones. If you separate the two, the first item that uh, Ms. Martin, Dr. Martin mentioned was if we just, if right now what we said was we want green zone for core indicators and green zone for the secondary indicators. Right, and so we're, we're the first item is to, is to monitor the secondary indicators and, uh, but not use that as our guidelines for returning to school. But I think where the confusion is, is I think what you're saying is you're, do you support going into the yellow zone for the core indicators? That's the question. You're you're on mute. Yeah. Got it. I have to look at that chart again and make sure that I'm understanding what we're doing. Ms. Basim, go ahead. Just to clarify too, so there are three core indicators, um, just to refresh real quick. So there's the, the case incidence, which is uh, you know per 100,000 persons. And then there's the percent positivity and then the third metric is the school district's readiness to implement the mitigation strategies. And so those are the three core indicators that we will use as our main um, measures to dictate uh, when we will return our students back to school. The, the question posed by Dr. Martin is, are we comfortable with bringing back students when beginning that phase phased in approach when we are in the moderate risk level so that's that's the question on the table so miss martin yes um i support the moderate risk level okay So, and that's, okay. The next, Dr. Berg, or Dr. Gabriel, go ahead. Sure. Um, to, um, in, the, in the spirit of togetherness and working um, so that way maybe we can maximize some of the areas that we do have agreement on, I would 
um, advocate that we do separate it out into um, different, and I'll just say the word, you know, motions, if that's what they'll end up being. So that way, because I think that there are some areas where we can all agree. Um, and then that way on the individual pieces, um, for example, the, um, the categories of risk, then that will be separated out and then individuals can vote um, how they feel. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to um, Ms. Campson's suggestion. Now, Ms. Sam Ms. Campson is suggesting that we start phasing in our special education student, uh, self-contained students as soon as possible. So my question would be to Dr. Birdsong, and you don't have to answer this just yet, but our question would be how soon could she get them in pending our agreement if we agree that we want to get those that population into our schools independent of everyone else. So, so immediately move forward with that phase and process. So I'm putting that on the table. Is there anybody in that has a question about that, comment or oppose? Is everyone in favor of that? Mr. Jordan, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm not in disagreement. I'm just not, just trying to make sure I'm understanding what's being said. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the administration will um, phase students in based upon the actions that the board takes uh, to the best of their ability, right? So I'm trying to, I'm not sure I'm understanding when you say as soon as possible, you mean, I mean, what does that mean outside of what the administration would already do anyway? I'm not sure I'm I'm not sure I understand what as soon as possible means. But, well, what that means is that while we've been discussing, you know, like currently our, our we passed the um, motion saying that when we get in when we get into the green level, green levels and our primary and, and secondary indicators, then Dr. Birdsong will start with phasing in the students, you know, in phase one that were identified. What this is is something separate, saying saying that, um, that, that the uh, special education self-contained student population could be phased in regardless of um, risk indicator levels. And that phase in would, would happen as soon as Dr. Birdsong could possibly have that done. Okay. Ms. Campson, go ahead. Well, I'd like to see the emphasis go on the reason for that distinction between the self-contained children with disabilities classes, um, mm -hmm. that the focus is because they are so highly academically vulnerable mm -hmm. that the decisions be made, made across the country by districts to put the, them in. And because you can, you can mitigate most of the concerns that people have. There's no concern with distancing. There's no concern with busing. The busing being so, children being so close together. There's no concern about the children being in the cafeteria. There's no crowded hallways during changes. In other words, it's a, it's a population that has a lot of individual um, conditions or situations put into their IEPs because of the level of support that they need. And that level of support kind of surrounds them in a way that leaves a lot of distance between them and, uh, and everyone else. And so it, they're, they're the safest when the schools are empty. Once everyone's in the schools, they're in the same situation as everyone else, but by themselves in those schools that have those classes. And as we know, a number of our schools do not even have self-contained classes in the building. And so that was my cons my consideration. And based on what I've been watching, uh, we all know that as time and months have dragged on, that we're finding that schools are not necessarily hot spots. Uh, they're not breeding grounds for the disease. It seems that when I think I saw Chesapeake did have one, that there was a connection in the school. But aside from that, that has not been happening. So we know it's getting as the virus gets worse, 
we're getting more information that schools are safer. And I'm listening to a lot of doctors say on news shows that they feel that kids should be coming back anyway. So I certainly feel that the group that's most academically vulnerable, but in the safest situation, we should go ahead and do what districts are doing across the country and let those children come back in so that they we don't continue seeing uh, them in a situation that does not match an IEP. I mean, I don't know, maybe all the IEP, IEPs are written in a way that virtual is included in everything they do, but it doesn't seem possible that that would, because with IEP kids, you're writing the best possible situation, the best possible circumstances that you can do for these children because they're highly vulnerable, even in regular person to person. But the but with virtual, it's, it's much much more extreme. So that's where my emphasis would be: is that we're, we're that this is a population that we could keep safer than any other, and that are the most most needed academically. Thank you for clarifying that again, Ms. Campson. Um, I'd like to give uh, Dr. Birdsong the opportunity to speak, and then go to Mr. Clinton. I just had a I had a clarifying question, and, and I think Ms. Mrs. Um, Campson answered that. So it sounds like. The proposal would be we're not going to use any type of health metrics to bring in the most vulnerable group of children, but we're going to set metrics for other groups of kids to come in. Is is that is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. Mr. Clinton, did you have a comment or question around that? Did we lose you? Mr. Clinton? Okay, um, so any other, con Does I just wanna get some um, feel for um, if anyone is willing to- I'm good, Dr. Martin. Okay, go ahead. No, I'm good, I didn't have any comments, I'm sorry. Okay. So I just wanna get um, an idea of uh, everyone's opinions about what Ms. Campson is proposing. That we send, that we begin sending the um, special education self-contained students return to in-person learning. Any opposition to that? Although we're saying, or the way it's written, it's saying that the health metrics is not being taken into consideration. It is. What we're doing is uh, we're basically saying it's okay in the red level. Right. right. That's correct. There's something wrong with the sound. Are y'all having a problem it's with it? Fuzzy. It's a little fuzzy. Did you want Ms. Smith to repeat herself? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm saying the way it's worded, we're saying with no ties to uh, health metrics, but we are. Now, so this class, she's ask, asking us to um, phase them in as soon as possible. So it's okay to bring that group in while the indicators are in the red. That's, well, mm -hmm. that would be also based on what the superintendent, if the superintendent sees the conditions in, in what's happening. We don't know from week to week where it's going to be. So certainly she would, am I not going, are you hearing me? I, I think, yeah, I think people are a little, still a little confused because you know, now to Ms. Smith's point, I, I think Ms. Smith is asking for the same clarity that I was asking for. It, it sounds like, you know, for special education self-contained children, what the proposal is, is not to, uh, to, to even, you know, look at the metrics, but just bring back the children regardless of where we're falling. If, if it's in the red, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. We're, we're bringing back special education children or children in self-contained settings. But for all the other groups, we would just, we would wait until the metrics are at a level, if you decide to revise them, to revise them. So to your point, Ms. Smith, I think what you've said is correct. There would be, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, there's a, um, advocacy for to bring back their self-contained children regardless of metrics. I think that's what Mrs. Campson is saying and correct me wrong if I'm wrong Ms. Campson. But the other groups of children, you would wait to a certain level um, you know if, if you're going to change from the lowest and lower uh, risk levels with that. Right. That's, 
<laughs> just for a little I prefer that we not say regardless of metrics because we are using the metrics. We're basically saying it's okay while we're in the red. But then in another statement, we want to say we're, we don't support the yellow and below, but we are. Right. You're right. Because you're right. Re regardless of the metrics, Mrs. Campson said, you know, bring back the children in self-contained setting, regardless of, of the metrics, but the phase in process for the remaining groups. That's basically what I said. But knowing that at any time the superintendent can make a, a decision if the situation, the whole city gets worse or something. But I'm just but I do think following the example that we see across the country with this right now for this particular group of children, it's been very successful and there have been no incidents reported of any problem with it because they're in a separate type of situation than the other children. Yes, that is what I'm saying. Dr. Bird, do you have any, any comments on that could help us understand what that phase, I know we've talked about things, all these things in other meetings, but can you please um, remind us what that would look like as far as phasing them in? And if that is something that you could do if we, if we voted on the 16th to handle that population separately. So, so what you're asking me to respond to right now is if the board decided to um, transition our self-contained children into our buildings, as soon as possible, mm -hmm. um, would the administration be able to do that? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, so like I've said time and time again, you know, we, we need at least three weeks to plan for that, for transportation and, and other operational things. So, um, so that is my response to that. Okay, so, so January, which was what my motion initially said. Right, January. Three weeks. Right, then it's January. Ms. Basine, go ahead. Based on what uh, Dr. Bart Birdsong just shared, and given um, that the 16th is the, the last week before we go on break, um, is, isn't that right, Dr. Birdsong? Yeah, that's our last week of school, full week of school. Mm -hmm. um, given all of the, the comments that I've heard, if we if we set a target, I mean, because that specific group of students we are saying can be, you know, at, at uh, any risk level, that we target that group for January 11th, bringing back the teachers on January 4th, so that they can prepare and plan, you know, to, to receive those students on the 11th, which is what I think was previous. That's, that was what was in the proposal, yes. Right, and, you know, perhaps, and, you know, based on, you know, perhaps we could be at a point where we have significantly improved conditions at that point in time. Um, you know, we can also look at that date as a trigger to begin uh, considering to phase in the remaining groups of, of students um, if, if the group is in agreement that we would consider a moderate risk level to bring in our next phase, which would be K-3. And then the phase after that is fourth and fifth. All The K-3 group is another group of students that had research is finding is, has not been problematic in the schools. Um, so, you know, I would like for us to, you know, I'm just trying to move this discussion along between the as soon as possible, which could be the rest of this month and, and start to, okay, let's just put a target date because that's what I'm hearing. We want a target date, but we also need to be focused on the conditions. And for that specific group, there are, we could be at any risk level. So let's, we also have to be considerate of the teachers and being able to get them in. Uh, so that they can plan to receive the students and we target back the teachers to return on January 4th, bring the students in on January 11th. Does that sound fair, Dr. Birdsong? Like, does that sound like a doable? I mean, that's for you to decide, I know, but I, I'm just trying to get us to a point where we can get to the next piece of, um, 
the next item to to uh, discuss if we're going to revise uh, the metrics. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I support the um, changing of the metrics to allow for the, the moderation. Um, I'm going to thank some more in terms of the um, self-contained students at uh, at any level, but I'm I I think I've been in agreement with Ms. Campson from July that I think those students need to come back and also have thought that there are other students that we could mm -hmm. bring back. But generally speaking for right now, I just wanna say that um, I support the change in the uh, indicators. And, um, and I think we need to end the discussion soon because I think the longer we discuss this, then we get pulled into- um, uh, You start cir circling the drain. Right. Well, no, I, I don't. I don't think it's. We say we're going to have this board discussion. We say we're going to have this consensus building, and I appreciate everybody that has worked to bring us to this point. I just, I'm a little uncomfortable then for us then to then put Dr. Birdsong on the spot. What we said was we would come here and build some consensus. We would then, at least as I understood it, work together towards action that we would take uh, on the 16th. And then that action, once people have an opportunity to, to vote, if we're going to do any reconsideration, as Mr. Clanton had mentioned earlier, then would give the clear expression of the will of the board. And I think Dr. Birdsong and administration should have as much flexibility as possible to then implement it. I think when, for me personally, I think when we start putting in dates and then the board starts talking about phases and dates and all those kinds of things, I think it complicates things for the administration. I agree with the expression that Mr. Clanton said earlier, whatever we do, we need to make sure that we are given enough time for the administration to do what they have to do and that we're given enough time for the public to know and the parents and students and everybody to adjust to it. I'm just cautious about any hard dates. I think the metrics in themselves have dates in there, 14 days and all the things that we've talked about. I think Dr. Birdsong has said to us three weeks, um, but if for some reason she felt she needed three and a half weeks or she felt she could do it in a week and a half, I don't wanna really stand in the way of that as long as we uh, know that we've already expressed to her uh, the importance that we wanna make sure that parents are notified. And I like to give her and the administration that opportunity to then do that without having to worry about what well, the board said you have to do this date or this many weeks or so forth. But generally speaking, I'm appreciative for the consideration of the adjustment of the uh, indicators because I've expressed before that I think the current indicators as we have them pretty much mean we will be virtual for the rest of the, the school year. The other thing I would just like for us to consider at the appropriate time, and maybe that's January, maybe that's on the 16th, is to just get a, at least for me, a re-understanding of the point where um, those that were in the uh, the VSA, um, you know, how, where that transition point is again, when you make the decision whether or not you want to uh, be in the VSA for the rest of the year or whatever the period is, or if you wanted to uh, switch out of that. I don't want to do that tonight, but I just is something that whenever it's appropriate, just like to make sure I understand how, how that process works again. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, Dr. Gabriel and then Ms. Basin. Sure, thank you, Dr. Martin. Um, if I can make a suggestion, would it be too much for um, you and Mr. Jordan to work with Ms. Tanner to put forth the um, prospective draft motions up on board docs so that way um, we can review them ahead of the December 16th meeting and then that way we'll have something, some language that's uniform um, that we can all base our, you know, comments and decision making off of. Absolutely, that was absolutely the plan to do. Okay. Okay. Great. 
Miss um, Basin and then Miss Campson. Yeah. I just, I was just wanted to apologize, Dr. Birdsong, for putting you on the spot. I certainly, as I said earlier, didn't want us to focus on the dates. We had that in our, we talked about that in our conversation. I was just simply trying to move us out of the as soon as possible into some po future point in time. But, um, you know, you, you know my thoughts around that. So I'll just end there. But I just wanted to apologize for putting you on the spot. And I appreciate your apology. And I accept it. Ms. Campson? Uh, just so I'm clear, so we have these four points, I think four points, and we've discussed grouping them all together or doing them each separately. Are we doing them each separately? Because, you know, I have ones that I'm set on where I am, but I have others that I'm not sure. And so it seems like at least we would get maybe most of what people have suggested if we do them one by one by one. I think that was Mr. Uh, Mr. Clanton's suggestion earlier tonight. Yeah, I don't see us come as Dr. Gabriel, but that's okay. I don't see us coming together on everything. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. I think that's better. Move forward with um, with revising the motion um, and possibly accepting a new one. So, okay. Well, um, thank you all so much for your information, you know, having this discussion. I know this is, you know, it's a lot and, um, and, we're going to continue to, to do a lot and have these hard conversations, um, you know, and, uh, and so I appreciate everyone working together on this. Um, so with that, if there's, oh, I'm sorry, there are more agenda items. I have to get back my agenda back up. Um, okay. So next on the agenda is um, board members requests for consideration for future agenda items. Anything new? Dr. Gabriel and then Ms. Smith and then Mr. Clinton. Sure. And um, this is this is an item for us to um, take into consideration, as I know that there are so many topics that the board, um, uh, you know, has uh, to discuss educational planning and whatnot. But over the years, we've heard a lot about uh, mental health services in our schools. And we are um, so fortunate to have the Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters, um, you know, right here in our backyard. And I would just say that I know that there have been conversations in the past, and Ms. Martin, you and I, Dr. Martin, you and I have sat on some of those conversations. Is there any way that we can leverage services as they are um, breaking ground on a tremendous um, work on mental health services in the area? Is there any way that we can work on combining efforts so that way we can bring some of those services into our schools, you know, when we do return back to in-person, so that way we can um, focus our budget priorities on, you know, teachers and educational delivery and maybe bring in, um, you know, those types of counselors and services into the school. So it's just a thought and an idea um, but something, if you guys could think about it when appropriate on the agenda, I would be very appreciative. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I have something in the works right now. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm waiting on a decision, um, along those lines, but I can, um, I'll be able to hopefully announce something soon. Um, but I'm happy to talk to you about it offline as well. Um, that is something that, um, has been on the agenda for a while. And um, so I appreciate you bringing it up again. Um, so next, um, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Uh, considering the diversity and equity um, director, especially with uh, the situation that we're in regarding the pandemic and where we're going to be when we come out of it, I think we need to strongly consider uh, putting someone in, in this district to help us work our way through this process. Um, I support, uh, the, the topic or concept that Dr. Gabriel brought up regarding counselors and social workers and the mental well-being of our students 
and looking into that further in terms of how it will help our children to succeed. Um, there was one other area that I know. So can you clarify um, when you're saying uh, post-pandemic help our children? Well, so we're already, we're going to see the impact that students being out of school and learning virtually, we're going to see the impact that that's going to have on them sooner than later. And we need to start addressing the issues that we know are already present because of the type of learning environment that we've been forced into because of the pandemic and to begin to address it now. I, we shouldn't have to or, or we shouldn't wait until next school year. Well, we are, but you know what I mean. We shouldn't wait too long. We know it's already there. So okay. we and what, what areas do you think we're waiting on? I'm just trying to get some clarification. Okay. Yeah. Be a good term. Um, but the gaps that are going to occur and are occurring because not all students learn well, and we've had it said to us over and over again um, with virtual in a virtual type environment. So mm -hmm to address this as quickly as possible. So a, a, um, a director of diversity and equity will be able to set us on a course that prepare us as, as quicker, quicker than normal, if you will. It's, it's a bigger picture than just... Yeah virtual I, I get I get the I get the gist of what you're saying is that we have strategies in place now to try to mitigate these increasing gaps because we know that there happen you know there there's going to be gaps um, at, as a result of learning in, in the current environment is that pretty accurate progress through through this this school year okay thanks Ms. Smith. And Ms. Basine, did I see your hand up? I, I was just going to clarify that we're not talking about budget priorities right now, right? We're we're talking about future agenda items. Yes. Right? Okay. I just want to be sure that everyone was on the same page. Yes. And um, <laughs> I wasn't on the same page then. I was, I thought. Oh, we were okay. <laughs> okay. You're talking about budget. Yes. Okay. That makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got that. Okay, and I sent everyone the budget timeline moving forward. So um, please have uh, your budget priorities to Rodney and I by the 9th, and we'll consolidate them and get you get them back to you, the full list um, on the 11th for you to review for the following Wednesday's meeting, where we can um, discuss them and vote. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much. Have a great remainder of your evening and stay safe. Oh, Dr. Birdsong, do you have closing? Yeah, are, are you getting ready to adjourn? I would like to um, introduce our new Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer before we leave. And so uh, Kanita, Mrs. Kanita Matthews is our new Chief Communications and Community Engagement Officer. So please join me in welcoming her to Norfolk Public Schools. Welcome, Mrs. Matthews. We have been waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, I told her I would give her to the end of the week before I start giving her the list so she can get settled in and organized and, and all of that. So um, we've already thoroughly enjoyed having her here. She's just been here for a couple of days and she has just jumped right in. So we're very pleased. That's great. And I know there are probably plenty of community stakeholders that just wrote your name down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm You're sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yes, you really so much. much. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Dr. Bird song. I appreciate that. All right, so have a great evening and um, and take care. D Dr. Gibson, did you have something to say? You okay? Okay. All right.
Good evening. Good night.